And so no fail is just kind of bringing it back to like, hey man, what were you taught when you learned how to ride a bike? Having a flyer go off somewhere else is almost as serious as a pistol shot for it. I think because, I mean, the original left and lights that were issued were like, what, 60 meters or something like yep. that? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Matt Lanford here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. Today, February 6, 2021. Today's episode, 258, How to Select the Worst Holster Ever. Seems like all kinds of social media groups discuss that on a regular basis. Why not discuss it with the professionals? Hopefully, this, uh, this episode is going to be a good primer on how to figure out what to, uh, what to get and what to avoid when it comes to a... Uh, a well-made holster. So before we start, big thanks to our sponsors. Big thanks to Filster Holsters. If you're looking for a near universal ambidextrous holster, specifically, it's very, it works, fun, it's very functional with uh, appendix carry uh, and also happens to work with the TLR1 HL and the X300U. It's the floodlight from Filster. So basically, I, I think I have three of them and uh, I have them set up a little differently. Uh, one's on a flex, um, DCC clips on all of them. Uh, just an absolutely great option. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the way it carries. It's somewhat modular where you can uh, move around some of the adjustment points just to fine tune your means of carry. Also big thank you to Staccato. I've been carrying a Staccato pistol for I don't know how long now. Uh, it's my duty gun. And I say this at the beginning of every episode where I'm, I'm mentioning staccato. Um, for someone who isn't used to shooting a single action only, like a 1911 style uh, gun, the idea of a manual safety can kind of be it can kind of be scary. And some people might think, well, I'll just carry uh, with a hammer forward or the hammer back, but the safety off. Not a good idea. So I'm carrying loaded chamber, hammer back, safety on. And with some reps, you get used to this, get some dry fire in, do some uh, practice your draws. And that manual safety turns into a non-issue. It is not going to slow up your ability to shoot. It is not going to slow up your ability to draw. It's just a matter of reps. So if you're looking for a, a nice production, high-end 2011 double stack nine millimeter that is optics ready, that has an awesome capacity, that can take a, a good weapon light, you're looking for the staccatos. Um, and there are multiple. There are uh, Glock 19 size, they're full size, and then there's even the extra large, the XC. Uh, great shooting pistols. Lastly, speaking of great shooting pistols, Walther Arms. In my opinion, for a striker fired pistol, these have the best triggers. Um, as a matter of fact, in the next week or two, there's some exciting news coming out from Walther. I'm, I'm excited about uh, being able to discuss some of this stuff. Uh, Bill Blowers has, and his eggplant uh, will be finally revealed. If you don't follow Bill on Facebook, that one, that comment probably just went over your head. Um, awesome pistols. If you're looking for a striker fired, good solid option, the PPQ series is, is pretty much where it's at. Everyone says get a Glock 19. The problem I found with the Glock 19 is, okay, a lot of people complain about the ergonomics. Yes, it is kind of shaped like a two by four. Um, but more importantly for me, the grip is just slightly too small for me. And I, I'm a big fan of having full pinky support when I shoot. So the PPQ actually has, well, the grip is not like a two by four. And then also I have pinky support when I shoot. So kind of important. Um, if you know someone that has one, if there's a gun store that has one, go hands-on, dry fire it a little, see what you think. Unfortunately, this is a brand that really doesn't get the attention it deserves because they really make some awesome pistols. Uh, the Q4 steel frame, the Q5 steel frame are just absolutely fantastic. Matter of fact, I have my Q5 right here. Um, just a, a solid pistol. The, uh, the slight additional weight also helps with recoil. Not that everyone needs it, but, you know, why not? It's kind of like uh, compensators on pistols. Why not take advantage of every possible uh, means to mitigate recoil? If it's going to make you shoot a little better, if it's going to help. So uh, lastly, big thank you to our Patreon subscribers. If you go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary, 
Um, you can help support all of this. Patreon doesn't just support the podcast. It supports the website, all the articles, it, the, the forum. Um, it does su support uh, YouTube content, audio content, podcast content. And we have multiple avenues of being able to support the whole network. Uh, if you don't want to go on Patreon, if you don't want to use PayPal, if you go to the forum, primaryandsecondary.com slash forum, you can basically upgrade your account. Let's see here. What did I call it? I called it forum support. And there's a big banner about that. So if you want to help support, go through that. Um, yeah, we, we're, we're, we have means other than PayPal to, uh, to cover those expenses. So I think we're going to start the show now. Uh, for, if we're talking about um, how, to, how to pick the worst holster, my first criteria for what would be the worst holster is that it has to be soft. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. it, it, it should be soft and probably stretchy. And if, if we're looking for the, the, the abs, if we want to pick the worst holster, it's going to be soft. It's going to be stretchy and it's not going to attach with anything really other than friction. Right. And that's, that's how you wind up in kind of like, Remora sticky holster territory. Right. And which is sort of like a, the suggestion that you should take this pocket holster and jam it in your pants is what, what, right? Like, what, I don't think we can take that seriously. And then the step up from that is, well, we're going to take this same thing that we should not have jammed into our pants and just put a uh, elastic strap on it. And that's somehow going to make it better. And that doesn't really solve any of the problems either. And Sarah says, uh, don't forget the magnetic one. We we actually have one of those. And JM4. I think it, yeah, I think uh, it dislodged itself from a pair of yoga pants after like two burpees, which I don't think cuts it. So I actually had a customer email me this week. Uh, I was saving it because Matt mentioned, or I got the email right after Matt called me on this podcast idea. And the dude was like, I went from a JM4 to an Orion and I was kind of hesitant, but uh, let, me, let me find it. JM4. Now, speaking of JMs, I actually was thinking about contacting Tony from JM Custom. I have one of his, I finally got one of his holsters. I understand the hype. Mm -hmm. I understand it. it. It makes sense. It's a very nice holster. JM4? No, it's a poorly made leather sock with a magnet. And then there's Barry. Hey. Late to the party. No worries. We haven't officially started yet. Uh, Matter of fact, there's one panelist. Um, I'm thinking, uh, should we invite her? Because I've talked to her about being on the podcast before, it's purely as an end user. So, and she could pose questions as the end user. And I can't find it now. Uh, might have been on Facebook or something. But yeah, but no, the guy bought into the hype of the JM4 and then had a bunch of problems. It, I don't know what group it was. Uh, basically was told, he said he was offended by all the stuff he read and then took it with a grain of salt, found a coupon code and then went and bought something and was like, Hey, these people are kind of right. Well, so what happens? That and that's the problem is so many people try whatever, you know, sticky holster, whatever. And then that's it. Right. Like I have, I own holsters from everybody who's on here right now and stuff from other competitors as well. And it's like, I've spent a shitload. Of, can I cuss on this? Yes, please. Cool. I've spent a shitload of money uh, on holsters and eventually you get to the point where it's like, all right, these are all pretty comparable quality. I'm just getting that extra like one to 2% of preference now. But even though I lucked out and I had a relatively good first holster, the stuff that I carry now obliterates that. And then I briefly dove into the sidecar thing when uh, like my favorite gun tubers were like nut and fancy and instructor zero and Lucas Botkin very briefly uh, <laughs> as a younger, poorer man, easily separated from his money, but nobody wants to try. So it's like, well, this holster is 30 bucks. Why would I spend 60 bucks on whatever, you know, 60, 70, 80. Yeah. But look at, but look at my six Anderson lowers I just bought. 
eighty percent lowers with no way to mill them out. Fuck yeah. There's a a really interesting thing that takes place in the um pricing structure of some of these things. Um Sarah tipped me off to this about what happens, for example, on the alien gear site, right? Now, we don't think of necessarily as alien gear customers as people who are prepared to go and drop 130 bucks on a holster. Oh, right? no, but they do. It's scary. But, mm-hmm. but they do because they do it because they they do it by getting kind of trapped in the um, there's a there's a term for it, the, the sort of like uh, uh, a distorted economics of it, the false economy of it, right? And the the, the, the a la carte stuff really right. makes people go. Yes, you you oh buy God. the uh, the platform that could potentially do the the three or four other things you want to try. Uh, so you you get the whatever the base is, and that costs you uh, just enough to get free shipping, right? It's like ninety nine bucks, and then there's free shipping. And then you buy this $25 module and this $40 module for the shoulder holster shit you're never going to use, or you get the drop leg part. And so you feel like you've kind of wound up with enough holsters to do what you want them to do, but you're not going to use all of them. And by the time you've done it, you've spent an equivalent amount of money to having bought one Safari land and one quality inside the waistband holster. If you had just sucked it up and made those purchases in a dedicated and researched way. Instead, you've spent somewhere north of $160 with alien gear to wind up with a bunch of stuff you're not going to use. And now you're $160 further from the quality results you wanted to, to wind up with. And I, and it's, and it's almost like it's, you know, that they have to know their customers, right? There's something, uh, a little predatory about it. Like if you know that your customers are that kind of low information sucker who make short sighted financial decisions, and then you take your entire product line and pricing structure and direct it towards them in an aggressive way. And your business model isn't one of necessarily innovation and quality but more of one of figuring out how to mine the resource that you found yourself with in terms of a customer base, then it gets like a little exploitive. I think, I think it's a little exploitational. It can, John. I'm, I think the, uh, the idea I've, so I've, I've talked up a number of the people who work at the, at the alien gear booth at different shot shows. Uh, one time I wanted to just get my hands on the, the fan attachment that they were uh, pimping that year. And, wanted to, <laughs> I remember. and I, I had a very nice conversation, but my overall impression was that the people, at least the eight or 10 people who I talked to at the booth were true believers in the sense that they were bought into the brand that they worked for. They believed the hype. They thought it actually worked well. And certainly at the, at the top at company, there may be some people who know who have gone out and like, if, if, if you've only ever been a cook at White Castle and you think that your sliders are awesome and you've never actually eaten any place that makes something that's an order of magnitude better in quality of ingredients and execution, you don't, you just don't know. I think probably most of the people who sell alien gear don't actually appreciate how vast the gulf is in the difference in performance between one of their rigs and a really well-built purpose-made appendix. So I think there's actually less, I think there's less of the sort of predatory thing and more of the blind leading the blind really enthusiastically. Oh, no. I, I, I think I think that the blind leading the blind enthusiastically goes most of the way up. And it yes. would be like, you know, I love White Castle and I'm thrilled to get a job at White Castle and I'm thrilled to help people open up a, a White Castle franchise. But somewhere someone is twiddling their mustache knowing what percentage of those burgers is horse meat. You yes. know, like... <laughs> <laughs> Horse meat with onions and cheese. It's high. Good, it's though. very high. That tastes it's familiar. It's very high. <laughs> you just don't appreciate White Castle. I <laughs> Who you I have been about? known to partake in the White Castle. I'd say it's like the White White Castle being so close to the niche in its shot is 
you know, they're set for that week. Uh, there was a White Castle down the block from our dorms when I was in college. So I got some mileage out of that. I'm, I'm like probably, you know, like 0.075% horse at this point from, from how much White Castle I ate. <laughs> Stage with it. What's the half life on horse in your body? <laughs> right. <laughs> no. So uh, part of that though is you know, they and Andrew. I think we. I think you and I and some other people might have actually been at their booth at the time. Um, they they believe it, but I think it's their perspective of what use is is just vastly different from ours too. Because I was actually uh, there's another group chat I was in uh, briefly and you know, one of the deep, dark secrets of the internet is work for me, works for me is kind of valid, but yes. you know, work, works for me is valid. If you don't know any better, if you're, you know, what you're trying to get out of it is far, far different. Um, and like a lot of the battles we're fighting is like, you know, we're, we're telling people their stuff is garbage, but they may be using, you know, if they only wear it for an hour a day, or if they only wear it down, you know, down the block to get gas in the truck and get a pack of cigarettes and come back, you know, they don't experience any of the things that, you know, we say are problems or if they never train, if they can't actually shoot, um, you know, if their idea of shooting a lot is, you know, a couple hundred rounds a year, um, you know, they're, we, you know, we're, we're hitting them really hard and we're hitting them emotionally and we're getting, you know, very emotional responses and they're, you know, digging down in their position and, you know, there just needs to be far more education. Right. I mean, like yeah. I can't come along and say to someone, no, that does not in fact work for you. Um, works for me is a subjective opinion <clears throat> and all subjective opinions are equally valuable, which is to say there is no net difference between subjective opinions. The way you develop a, net difference in opinion value is by adding objectivity to an opinion. And that's when you get into things like, you know, uh, measurable performance standards and, and stuff like that. So you can't come along to anyone and say, no, that doesn't in fact work for you. Um, yeah. The, the sponge, the SpongeBob meme is not winning too many people over. No, I mean, and, and in some cases, if you ask someone in the wrong tone, well, what measurable objective standards do you have for, coming to an opinion that you can recommend, I mean, that flusters people and, and, and they don't like it. Um, and that's how you get online bullying. And, and to some degree, I think, I think it's important that we spend time insisting on um, if I'm not going to come along to someone and say your opinion's worthless. I might suggest that if you want to cause people to value your opinion, you should add objectivity to it that has value to them beyond just the opinion of it, you know? And I think we can ask for that. I think that's fair. Well, and on the like valuable opinion side, there are not often, but there are a handful of relatively well-respected people in the industry, specifically regarding sidecar holsters, right? I know we're not specifically talking about that, but they kind of fall in here a little bit higher quality than like a sticky holster that do that are proponents of not awesome holsters. Uh, and I think that helps support the argument of people who may not know themselves. And, and maybe it's not somebody who's like, well, I've only shoot 300 rounds a year. You do have guys who are like, I've shoot thousands and thousands of rounds a year, but it looks like I'm shooting my target with a shotgun even though it's my glock at seven yards because i just don't have that con you know what is good shooting right like when i was the best shooter i knew and then i went to my first uspsa match and was like oh jesus christ like how am i the best shooter i know i missed literally half my shots at that match there, there's no contacts and they look to a handful of folks who who knows why they're pimping a particular holster that's maybe poor quality so that's, you kind of mentioned another thing that I, I tried to put in, in some of the groups we're all in, I tried to entertain some of the nuance and, you know, you know, somebody who's belittling uh, the Serpa and, and some other holsters mm -hmm. and I, nuance is just lost anywhere. And I don't know if I was 
explaining it poorly or whatever or not, but people were like, you know, the Blackhawks piece of junk. Like, no, the, the Serpa is very well made for a design that lends itself to more uh, failures than we'd like. You know, they, you know, pick a sidecar brand. They're all very well made. They're just not things we probably want to use. Yes. So, and then people, you know, back to the, uh, John, the podcast you and Sarah did, um, communication. You know, I, I think for, for what we're trying to do and in education and just, you know, getting people into better products, um, you know, we, we've done a lot, but we're down to the, you know, we're down to where our words matter far, far more than they ever did. Yeah, and I think one of the things that we should be discussing more is the technical execution and overall manufacturing quality of a wide swath of holster brands is evening out. Um, Ten years ago, we were in a spot where there were some pretty wild differences in manufacturing quality. You could have some folks who were vacuum forming and some folks who were pressure forming and some folks who were vacuum forming poorly. Right. And, and, and there were pretty wide variations in uh, uh, consistency and, and, and technical execution. And there are plenty of holsters out there right now that are made just fine. They are made well, they aren't unsafe the execution is incredibly clean, and it comes down to a matter status. Of, of design. So, yeah, state of the art is only a couple hundred dollars anymore. It's not, you know, you, you can buy, you know, quote unquote, state of the art manufacturing. You know, any any website, you know, you could get rolling for under a thousand dollars, under five hundred, really. And you know what we say to that, Tom? What we say to that is, you're welcome, holster makers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, it comes down to the, the fact that you could have a design for a holster that has absolutely nothing to do with concealment, has nothing to do with human anatomy, takes into consideration none of the uh, uh, concealment mechanics that we're trying to capture and works uh, on a, a, an incredibly narrow cross section of, 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 of people. And you could do it so much better than we could have made a holster 10 years ago. And I think there's something about that that's a little deceptive. So you can get stuff that looks really clean, um, is incredibly consistent, uh, comes in all the colors that you want. You can price it up, you know, a couple hundred bucks. And so the perception of quality is all there. But, and and there will be, you know, check boxes for certain kinds of features that we've come to expect, whether or not they wind up doing what they intend to do. So you can get a holster that on paper and in its pictures and in in its actual thing is a good, is a good holster. And then wind up being very confused about why it doesn't generate the level of concealment that you wanted it to, or why it's uncomfortable or why there's uh, you get a lot of fatigue from wearing it, for example, or you're, you know, it causes body pain. So people are in the circumstance now where they can wind up with something that uh, is deceptively good at the superficial level and then can't see through that to ascertain why they're having problems with it. You know, I bought something that comes really highly recommended and it's great and it looks good and it costs money and it's got X, Y, and Z features and I just can't make it work. I mean, I don't know how, like, I don't know how frustrating that is because, you know, back in the day when we, uh, we all got into this, it was kind of obvious to a certain degree why the holsters we had weren't that great because they weren't that great back then. You know, how many, how many people do you think are buying the, <clears throat> the go-to holster and they're running into issues and they don't want to speak up because they're going to be made fun of for it? Or maybe they're carrying, they, they bought an appendix holster and there's something just wrong with it, but everyone says appendix is great. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to deal with this pain. Unfortunately, though, they're also using a really crappy holster at the same time, but. 
I think there's a couple of different scenarios there. I, I think uh, Holster World has really caught up. Like even even the um, because I still subject myself to general population Kydex Holster groups as Andrew sees. Um, you know, even even all of those people have kind of caught up to like what what the general consensus among you know the people that have been doing you know the appendix stuff the longest you know, what, what's been settled on is right. You know, those people have caught up, but the thing that hasn't caught up, uh, I mean, how many, uh, there's still nylon belt companies out there making like three and four layer scuba webbing belts and stuff like that. I, I think we have, we still have a lot of, of belt problems going on. Um, I lost, there was something else I had, I lost it. Well, yeah. And even that, right. So, holster design specific things that go into a, you know, a pinnock carry specifically uh because that's what i'm more familiar with like you're talking about with belts being important but even you know to get better concealment talking about like pants um alex sanson of the shoot it's just talking about like ride high to your pants and stuff like that and i brought that up it's like well maybe if you push pants down a little bit pull them up higher or something like that and i've been laughed at like hey idiot i don't care about how my pants sit on me that doesn't have anything to do with concealment i was like all right well okay. It, people have some idea of what goes into concealment, but they still don't understand all the facets of it. And we see the same thing with like holsters, right? It's like, okay, it's got like a claw and a wedge. I'm good. No, no there's more to it than just those couple little check boxes. And yeah. That, I, I, yeah. I, I hesitate to say system because, you know, it, we keep, uh, last couple of modcasts have, have uh, thrown back to the Magpul DVD stuff where everything was, a <laughs> everything <laughs> Everything was a system, but, um, but no, like, you know, the holster is just one component of, you know, carrying a pistol, you know, your, your pants define where the whole part of where the holster is going to be. Your belt defines how the holster interacts with the body a little bit. And, you know, so we may have, you know, made great strides in the holster side of things. Uh, we still can't overcome the belt side of things. We still can't be, get people to go do it. So, and I have some illustrations coming. Um, artist had a death in the family, so it's kind of kind of delayed that. But um, you know, we still have people like, well, you need to upsize your pants for appendix carry, and you know, so they're going. I don't know how many how many of you guys have tried, you know, going up to because men's pants is yeah, men's pants are two inch increments. You know, you're lucky sometimes if you get one inch, but you know, when you go up to add an extra two inches of fabric that really plays hell with how the, with how everything works. So you got people going up plus, you know, they go plus two on the pants and then they go and they get a gun belt and, you know, nothing works, you know, no matter how, you know, belt wedge wing, um, even just a normal holster, you know, just straight drop IWB. None of those play well with a steel hula hoop. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, what you have is people that are, they've, they've tried what they thought is the right thing. And it's like, well, it doesn't work. This is, you know, this is garbage. This is BS. Yeah. Something that we've run into also, we've been, um, as, as, as part of trying to get the, uh, um, customer service hurricane of, of the Enigma under control, we've been running a, a Facebook group called the Filster Concealment Workshop. And in there, we do a lot of like, uh, <clears throat> heavier kind of like one-on-one -on -one or group-on-one um, mentoring of, of people who are dealing with their concealment issues. And we're talking about pants, pants height, um, high or low rise pants in addition to the pants height makes a difference too, because the distance between the belt line and the, and the, um, the, the groin of the, of, of the pants and the material of the pants will also impact how the holster interfaces with the body. And, a lot of people run into an issue where they might have pants that are fairly low rise and, but have everything else working correctly. And they get a lot of belt tip over because of where the pants belt line encounters their body. So it's sort of like, uh, imagine a globe and then the most of the gun is in the Southern, Southern hemisphere. So you've got the, the, uh, uh, you wind up with this part of the gun printing really badly because it tips out with the entire, you know, abdomen here. So the sort of lowest peak of the abdomen winds up uh, 
landing here on the gun and you get print like unrestrainable printing. But if you were to wear higher waisted pants, you could uh, get more of the gun to land on the body in a way that's more conducive to concealment. And nobody talks about what kind of pants are you wearing? Um, other stuff is like what time was talking about in terms of, uh, jean sizing. I don't know if, if you've gone jeans shopping lately, but men's jeans are like wildly different everywhere. There's like, uh, some brands, um, say 34 on them, but they're actually 36 inches. And, and they say that because men need to be flattered too, apparently about their waistline. Um, uh, another thing that a, a lot of guys run into, you know, it's happened to me with COVID. I haven't gone out and bought new jeans. My waistline gets a little bit bigger. Um, and, uh, as that occurs, my pants just naturally ride a little bit lower. So as they ride a little bit lower, the part of me that gets bigger pushes the gun out a little bit more and you get a little bit more belt tip over. And a lot of guys wind up perpetually wearing their pants lower instead of sizing their pants up and keeping, keeping them at the same height. So it's kind of like, a, uh, they don't, they don't realize how much their pants have to do with how they're concealing. And they wind up, you know, I can't sit down when I appendix carry or the muzzle sticks me in the groin or it sticks me in the leg. I'm like, if it's hitting you in the leg, then your pants are pretty low, you know? Uh, Generally speaking, I like it when the uh, rear sight is at the same kind of uh, longitude. Is that is that the one that goes around, or is that latitude? That's latitude. Longitude is this way. Uh, yes. Uh, at the same, at least, uh, latitude is my navel. So uh, that positions it correctly on my body such that the muzzle doesn't contact my leg and I don't get a lot of abdomen induced gun outward tilt. Well, and on a similar note, right? Like pant design, like you were just talking about, John, even between jeans, like what exactly is the material it made out of? Cause like I wear Levi's Duluth and I have a pair of five eleven jeans so I could be extra high speed. The Duluth mm -hmm. jeans, uh, one, the crotch is a little bit different. It's got a gusseted crotch. So that interacts a little bit differently than like the standard single seam. The Duluth pants are also slightly stretchy, so you don't tear them when you bend. So that impacts how my holster is. Or if your dude's wearing like, you know, the Magpul pants or BDU pants, as a guy who wore ABUs in the Air Force, right? I had some nice little stretchies on the uh, waistband so that when I got fat in the winter months, right? They didn't get any tighter on me and I didn't feel bad about myself. But then, you know, crossover, they're still BDU style pants, but now the new kinds have no right. But what kind of material do you have? How's that interacting with things as well? Because that could play into it, not just the size and the cut, but what's actually go what materials are going into this? Oh yeah, and whatever the uh, the, the, the the top hem of the pants. Yes, uh, that influences the holster as well. So some are fairly thin and narrow, and then for example, I've got a pair of five uh, elevens that are really beefy along the the top of the mm -hmm. pant. And that itself puts different pressures on the holster than just the belt does. And that also distributes belt pressure differently across the face of the holster in such a way that causes the holster to perform differently in those pants with all, uh, with it, with everything else remaining the same. You know, if I hold everything else equal, I use the same belt, wear it at the same height on my body. And I use those pants. I, first, I might have to contend with the belt loop width and location. So, for example, like some BDUs or 511s, for example, have a have beefier belt loops, and you might need to, you might be forced to adjust the location of the holster based on the belt loops in the pants, and that that plus the different dimensions and construction of the pants themselves are going to apply different pressures to the holster. So you can't necessarily have one prescription across your entire wardrobe, which is so annoying. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, that, that's my issues. I put my clips around the belt loops and my 511s are the like military pants, right? The seven belt loop pants. My Duluth and my Levi's are five belt loops. Slight, you know, slight variation to change. But as we know, just a, a fraction of an inch 
relocation along the belt line can substantially impact comfort and concealment. Well, it's that same fraction of an inch that whenever, you know, people try to find their spot for appendix carry, especially for the first time, it's, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, you know, a quarter inch mm -hmm. or so. And, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, in, in customer service side of things, you know, it's like what pants and, you know, if the guy's, well, if the guy's weird and doesn't wear the same pair of pants, you know, for five days in a row um, <laughs> and, and they're trying, they're trying something, especially now, but, uh, you know, if they're, if they go between three different pairs of pants for three days and they try to go, you know, a little towards center line, a little further away, um, it gets all over the place. You know, and, I, and that kind of circles back to what we were talking about earlier with your, how much ex, ex, you know, training experience knowledge do you have, right? Like how much time have we put forth in the micro adjustments of our belt loops of it along our pants to find it more perfect. Whereas most guys will throw it in the pants that doesn't, that's uncomfortable. Fuck appendix carry. And then they, you know, eat the holster away and appendix carry is dumb. You'll shoot your dick off. Okay. I actually didn't put forth enough time to, fit, to make it work for me because it can work very well with the right effort. You know, there is a solution that you guys are completely ignoring that doesn't, it doesn't matter about the, the, the loops. It's called this enigma. And if you're <laughs> using this enigma thing, loops don't, don't matter. I just, just want to throw that out there. And supposedly there's a light bearing version coming. So we are working on that. Yeah. It's not in and stock. I actually, um, I answered a, somebody had a question. I answered it and said, told me to get on the wait list. <laughs> oh God, the wait list. We're working and, on it. And, and it's a lot more family friendly than the old keister carrier when you're trying not to print along the waistline. <laughs> So there's a there's a kind of a, a a ditch on both sides on the holster adjustment thing because I have seen people who say I've been struggling with this setup for like six months and it's hurting me and I have back pain and I never want to wear my gun and I simultaneously want to tell all these carriers like it's okay to cut bait if you end up with a rig that doesn't work for you it might just be a rig that doesn't work for you there is no there is no hundred percent thing. Like I can't tell you what's going to fit your body on the flip side saying expect to have to put a lot of work into this. This is like a bespoke suit, but the tailor only does 60% of the work. He sends you the suit and parts of it still have pins in it. You've got to let it out and you make it a job and finish throwing it up and lock tight your crap. But the, uh, they need to be given permission both to monkey around with stuff and play with all the variables, knowing that those variables matter, that there are real gains to be made and that they should be documenting that. Like the, the idea of having, like I take notes on the jujitsu classes I go to because I'm not going to remember everything that worked for me at different times. And if I don't, if I don't compile it in some place where I can go back to it later and see, Oh, that was the thing. Then I'm, I'm just going to lose it. I might find the gains, but I won't hold on to them. They won't remain with me, but giving them permission to just say, Hey, maybe this kind of thing isn't for me and not feel like they're violating like brand loyalty. Like I've had customers, I've had more returns in the past year than I'd had in the previous eight years of business. And I look at that and say, I gotta say, man, are we slipping? Or I can say, I'm getting a whole bunch of brand new customers who had never heard of me before. And they're coming into this ecosystem for the very first time. They're not fully prepared. I haven't provided the resources to orient them correctly. And they come and they smack right into my holster design. And, you know, sometimes they respond and send me an email and say, Hey, I don't understand. And sometimes they send me an email and say, Hey, your holster is too long. I fixed it with a hacksaw. And sometimes they send me an email and say, can you send me a label? I'd like to send this back for a refund. I get, you know, we get all those things, but telling them, you know, when a, when a customer asks for a refund, cause they say it's just not working for me. Um, I don't ever try to tell them that they need to find a way to make it work for them. I just say, thanks for giving us a shot. Here's your prepaid label. Here are a couple other brands I would recommend. And then if they can give me, if they can start to articulate anything about why it's not working for them, I can sort of point them in the direction of, okay, maybe they'll, they need a holster that doesn't have a wedge. Then look at this company, or maybe they need something that has this kind of attachment. Maybe look at this company and I can start to steer them hopefully 
and use my reservoir of knowledge about what's out there so that their next go round is not just going to be them getting back on, you know, Reddit CCW and asking best holster for P365 XL question mark. Cause Reddit CCW not- is actually not that bad. <laughs> it's gotten a lot better. No, but um, gotten- back to one of the things you said, I, I am, I'm, agonizingly slow on uh at least not automated on like the return stuff like i'll yeah. ask everybody like what did you try you know it's like uh, and i need to be and i've started to become more forthcoming like hey i'll you know we'll take it back but if you can tell me what you did and what didn't work um you know it you might not have a problem that i'm willing to make any changes for but yeah. you might also have a problem that i can tell you again you know go here go there um, or, you know, sometimes, you know, maybe, you know, if I've actually had people that have bought, you know, Andrew, uh, that bought Henry Ulster's filter, mine and JM all at the same time. And they said none of them worked or mine was the only one that didn't work or, or, or whatever. And, you know, just knowing where they're at and what they're trying. And more often than not, it winds up being something silly and, you know, I'm, I'm not trying, you know, the, keeping their money, you know, me having their money isn't, isn't worth it. If they're pissed off, uh, totally. them having my holster isn't worth it if they're pissed off, you know, so the easiest way to go is to everybody return back to, you know, the prior state, but more often than not, it's, it's always stupid little things. You yeah. Know, gen- generally really I'll ask this. people. Oh, no, I was, I was just going to say, when we think about this, think of the years of experience we have dealing with this, the various holsters we've used, the different methods. I've been carrying a gun since I don't know how long. As a cop, I'm carrying strong side, off duty, I'm carrying whatever. Um, people discuss this like it's in, it's intuitive. It's really not. Strong yeah. side, okay, that can be intuitive. <clears throat> Appendix, no. Uh, John, you've been there, I don't think it awesome is. Things. It's, it's, people it's, aren't it's intuitive, intuitive, though. No. So the, the thing is, we need to recognize that most of the people who on their concealed carry journey are the equivalent of someone who has been put in a car with a manual transmission, zero instruction, and has been given no clues about what actually happens when they press the clutch pedal and move the lever. And they are in a parking lot by themselves trying to learn how to drive stick with no instruction and no technical knowledge about what's going on anywhere underneath them in the car. Like they don't know. Right. So... (laughs) You know, we're going to get a lot of people who say, oh, my oh my God, I, this thing doesn't go in reverse or it smells like clutch in here. You know, like, yes, it smells like clutch in here. Let's uh, let's have a, a, you know, let's talk about. I mean, do you want to return the car? Or would you like to learn a little bit about what happens when you press the clutch pedal? And so any more, you know, we run it like a. I think like a, like a, like a one and a half percent return rate on average. Um, and, you know, after a year like 2020, it feels like a lot. Sometimes it feels like, oh my God, nobody likes these holsters. Everyone's returning them, but it's, it's been a busy year and it stayed about flat at one and a half percent. And, you know, one in every hundred or so people is like, this didn't work for me or, you know, it's too big or it's not comfortable or I don't understand the features of the holster that I've purchased. And, and most of the time, you know, we say, sure, no problem. Just send it back. You know, it's, it's easier to say, uh, just, just to help, you know, take the return. Um, and every once in a while, depending on the, the vibe that you get from the email and the person sending the message, you ask, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm sorry to hear you're having trouble with the holster. We are happy to process your return. And we are also happy to, give you uh, tips, tricks, and pointers about how to make this work because none of this process is obvious. And it's, it's not. And, and the thing is, you know, when you take a class about concealed carry, you learn how to uh, draw from concealment and you learn something about uh, use of force in your jurisdiction, right? That's, that's the typical it, concealed carry class. If you're lucky. If, if well, you're yeah, lucky. Most yeah, of the time, it's just mine. Most of the time, it's just rounds on a target, um, right. if, if we're being honest. And, you know, where, again, as far as the instructors we seek out, you know, we get the bone, we, we get what I'd call probably bonus content. Right. But one of the things that people don't get taught 
in their carrying, you know, the classes built for concealed carry are mostly based around shooting and to some degree, the consequences and decision-making surrounding shooting. Concealed carry classes don't teach you anything about how to live with a gun. Like one, one of the, like one of the most fascinating things from the uh, concealment workshop is hearing in detail about a wide range of everyone's day-to-day -day challenges of carrying a gun. And a lot of this, this stuff doesn't get discussed. Like making it easier for people to go to the restroom with a gun on apparently is <laughs> like legit life changing for people. And everyone in their own way has sort of like figured out how to get from like second to third at 45 miles an hour without stalling the car when it comes to um, uh, how to use the urinal. Like everyone has had to figure out how to carry a gun and use a urinal kind of on their own. And there's no like best practice for that. And there's no like exchange of information surrounding how do you control your firearm in a public space when you're trying to relieve yourself. And people do that every day. You're going to do that a million times before you shoot somebody, right? Like the, the chances of you being in a defensive gun use are so much higher or so much lower than, than, than you having some weird struggle with your gun in the toilet, <clears throat> you know, and, and that's one of the things that everyone's like, you know, trying to uh, figure out how to do, but isn't being taught. And there's no resource to learn that. And so when people don't, when you realize that people don't have that basic skill set, and none of us really do, there's, no, there's not like a codified skill set on like, here's the best practices for, for using the, the restroom when you've got a gun. It's no surprise that people know even less about uh, taking advantage of the mechanics of concealment to cause it to, in, in, in a way that they can self-diagnose and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, leverage to generate concealment. Like we can't even do the basics and, and we're kind of surprised that, you know, there's a certain amount of stuff that doesn't catch on in, 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 an, in an intuitive way. I want to point out before we continue any further, everything that has been said so far is it's the, it's the truth. And it's, it's unfortunately kind of a sad truth because people are going to be in denial. They're going to listen to this part of the podcast and go, Oh, this is bullshit. This is stupid. That's not true. It is true. There are a lot of people that they they don't, they don't have a background or they haven't done the research and they buy brand X holster and expect this to change their life. And there's something about it that they didn't understand. And that's why these returns uh, have occurred as, as you guys have brought up. Interesting well, data point on the returns. Normally I group returns. So anytime somebody requests to return something, our standard policy, which we have on our website and which we do our, our routine is I send them a prepaid label. As soon as the holster arrives back, I just do a very cursory inspection to make sure it's all there. And then it goes in a bin they get a refund issued immediately. And then at a certain point when I've got enough holsters in that bin to be worth spending an hour taking everything apart, I usually go through them all, pull them out of their packages, give them more thorough inspection. And those go in my sort of trainers, demos, lenders, whatever bin. Um, and what I found is this year, usually consistently half or slightly more than half of the holsters in my return bin on detail inspection were misassembled. Like the customer had tried to resize their loops and had gotten the hardware wrong or had tried to readjust, you know, change the modeling configuration and it put the insert on backwards or had, you know, like, and, and, and things that would really impact the function, like dudes putting the rubber washers on the inside of the holster and then squishing it. So it rubs against the side of the gun and then wondering why the holster feels draggy. And so there's clearly something going on there where, some number of the people who were making returns were had had found a way to make the product misperform. Yeah. That I hadn't anticipated. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and oh go for go it. Go ahead. 
Oh, yeah, and yeah, that, and just, that's just a constant thing I need to find a way to solve. <laughs> yeah. So, so and, and on that, right, I just experienced something very similar to that. Um, major point is that people a lot of times are either sometimes it's like you're afraid to ask a question because you don't want to look stupid. Right. And be yep. like, ha ha, dumb kid, dumb kid. Um, or you think, well, this is like they don't know maybe how big of an operation y'all are running. Like, well, I'll never get like a personalized response from these guys. I'm not even going to try to ask, you know, Henry, Philster, Darkstar, whoever, um, how to fix my thing. I lucked out and I got an enigma because uh, somebody texted me about it. I'm not on the email list, but somebody texted me and told me they were in stock. I tried to assemble it. I was supposed to do that. <laughs> ah, I assembled it at 1 a.m., and it turned out I was doing something wrong. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, this thing sucks. They sent it to me wrong. It's bad. God damn it. And then I sat there for like 20 minutes, not doing anything with it. And then instantly was like, oh, wait, I'm an idiot. And I put it together. I was like, okay, never mind. This isn't wrong and dumb and stupid. I'm the stupid one. And people are afraid to say, oh, wait, I'm the idiot here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, very much so. And somebody won't bring this up. I'll bring it up for them. There was an instant incident this week where somebody just, could not look at a picture and make their stuff in front of them look like the picture online. Yeah. And people are very, they're so willing to just, you know, you know, fuck it and send it back. That's mm-hmm. the world we live in right now. Everything's instantaneous. We get the answer right now. We get our food. Now we get everything. Now uh, there's no such thing as work ethic. There's no such to, thing as any of this stuff. But to Andrew's point, um, a lot of the same returns I've had this year. I mean, 2020 has been, a boatload of, of new customers, you know, yep. of you, of You're unique welcome. customers. I don't know if they came from primary and secondary. I don't know. It's just from me though. <laughs> but no, it's, it's, it's a lot of new gunners. It's a lot of people, you know, thinking that they want to go and, you know, start doing this stuff and having, you know, very little idea what they're, you know, what they're getting into. They'll get, they'll get it configured one way and then they go and they play with it and, you know, they make it not work basically. Yep. And so, it's been probably, probably about half of them have been, you know, things that just didn't work. The other half are people who've, you know, based on, you know, taking a look at the inside, just people that haven't given it a fair shake. And, you know, that's some of that's on me, some of that's on them for it just not be, well, not necessarily on them. You know, some of it's, it's just not their thing. That's, that's fine. Um, but, you know, if anything, 2020 has shown me, um, and John, I think you basically alluded to it, is we're just not doing nearly enough on education. We've, you know, I, I know I've relied on being in a niche market for over a decade and, you know, getting new customers who don't have, you know, they've not been doing this as long as I have. They don't have as much of this knowledge. They, we got to give it to them somehow. Yeah, we've we've gone essentially overnight from having been in a situation where I could guarantee that if someone was ordering from me, it was someone who had had to have gone down a certain path to find me. Yeah. You know, like we were sort of out of the way in the woods. And anytime I heard a knock on my door, I was like, ah, I see you seek Philster. Right. And, and, <laughs> and, and they had to sort of go there to get there. And it, it's not, and, and all of a sudden, o- over 2020, someone built the main road right next to us. And so now everyone who, who jumps off at the, at, the, at the rest stop is like, who's this weirdo? Right here? next to two, <laughs> right? The highway and, goes to your door now. And so uh, <laughs> I'm like, oh, you don't seek Filster. Let me teach you about the weird shit we do here now. And so like... The, this was the first year that we actually had to implement stuff like a lot of like video instruction and even, you know, printed instruction. Mostly it's just like, here's a link to, you know, a video on, on the website. And now we give people like a, a, a printed piece of instruction. Um, we've got like a, a booklet with graphics and everything on like the basic systems of, of, of how these holsters work and how to set them up. And that does a great job of reducing assembly and configuration returns by maybe a third reducing but not eliminating because right. people like we, people people are just not intuitive well they don't 
it's hard because what we think of obvious, like obviousness isn't necessarily an innate feature of a thing. Obviousness is an experience that you have as the result of recognizing something that's familiar, right? You and I can look at the same thing and have very different experiences of obviousness. Um, and I know that having done this for a very long time, what I think of uh, as being obvious is highly skewed. And so I always have to like double back considerably to re-examine whether or not I'm like spelling it out correctly and, and being obvious enough or explicit enough in, in a description or a, a, a instruction of a thing. And then you add that to the fact that not everyone learns or understands things the same way. So some people need to see a video. One of the things that we ran into with the Enigma is that uh, someone in the user group came along and just screenshotted the video and wrote up text to go with it because not everyone is going to follow along with a video and they would rather have something like that. Some people, they need you to kind of like walk them through it a little bit. You know, it's, it's hard to watch a video. Maybe you need to watch somebody actually do it or have uh, be in a position where you can ask questions as you go through the process, because sometimes you think you're doing it right, but you know, you've got some nerves about committing to one thing or another and you don't want to break anything. And you'd rather be in a position where you can ask before you do something that feels permanent. Right. So like, not only do you have to have decent instructions, but they've got to be variated in a way that accounts for everyone's different information consumption. Um, and some people don't need instructions. Some people look at the picture of the thing and then make what's in front of them look like the picture. Um, and it's, it's a matter of like, how much resources do you want to dump into instructions? Because then after a certain point, it's like, have I, spent a lot of time and a lot of resources to deliver the best instructions that I possibly can in order to cause people who don't understand the concepts to be able to use the holster. And they still don't understand the concepts, right? So they might not have a, I might be converting assembly related returns into um, customer education related returns, right? Am I just pushing them off to um, a different, kind of return how many of these assembly related returns are in fact masking customer education related concerns yeah well and you know you guys as manufacturers can include all sorts of directions whether it's graphics or text or video but uh you know it obviously is probably everybody here has seen like your group specifically right filster concealment workshop other groups like primary and secondary have a community of people who are knowledgeable, educated on these things to help other people. Maybe somebody in there can word it in a way that none of us would have thought of, right? Um, where, and unfortunately, those groups, the, the more effective groups are substantially smaller than like Glock Nation, for example, right? Where you're just being spoon fed at best, probably okay information, usually bad information, and at most, one or two word answers like, that sucks, uh, no no buy NSR tactical, uh, no buy T-Rex arms, you know, wh whatever, right? Like, I, I literally got banned from there because I have big copy and paste things that instead of me having to reply, type out my reply every time, I would just paste them into a I thing. The same. And they're like, no, fuck you, we don't like that blocked yeah. I, was, I was like well i want to have a light bearing holster well here's some consideration for light bearing stuff you know full-size lights i've used the filster spotlight uh here's my feelings on that uh i've used the boweda gotham v2 um i prefer it to the filster for these reasons however the filster is still really good and a lot of people like it here's some potential advantages to the filster and i've had really good customer service with john Not like i broke one of your holsters on a sunday and i emailed you and literally within five minutes you had responded to me what's your address i'll send you a new one right now and i was like motherfucker it's a sunday like why are you replying to me i didn't expect to get back hear back from you for a week like so, so having a community of people can potentially help fill the gaps uh that you guys might have might have the time or effort to do and eventually you're still going to have people who aren't doing it, right? Like I, I have a friend in the middle of a blizzard. They couldn't figure out how to make their garage door shut. 
and instead of calling their dad, talk, knock on a neighbor's door, or whatever, they just left the garage door open in a blizzard for five hours until I could get there. I was like, you know, this cord, did you ever wonder what that did? It's like, yeah, I wonder what that did. I didn't want to pull it and break something. Did you call anybody? Did you, did you call your landlord? There's well, a tag no. on it that says what it does. Yeah. And, and like, no. Did you not a, Google not that shit? Yeah. yeah. And, and they couldn't have, it was like, what, what the fuck's wrong with you? Like, oh. So you always have people like that, no matter how much work y'all or the community at large does. Well, I, I think that actually speaks to what, like, you know, one of the responses that's been really big for me is, have you met people? And <laughs> it was like, well, how could people do something like that? It, well, have you met people? You know, it's people are, whenever they make a choice, they put a lot of effort into it. You know, the the downside of the internet is that, you know, everybody thinks that a Google search is research and anybody who invests any amount of time into it is now emotionally attached to it. So if they've done research, that is a, you know, they click on the first link of Google and, you know, they read some shitty article or a Reddit post or some bad forum post and they bought a crossbreed, you know, there are three layers of emotional investment into things. And a and hundred bucks. Yeah. Well, and on that specifically, um, I said this to Matt earlier in a uh, Facebook message, but it's, it's like a lot of people I know who are just getting into guns are finding holster companies based upon what is sent to them through the YouTube ads and Facebook ads prior to Facebook banning those. And 99.99% of the time, those holsters are dog shit. But it's like, well, my YouTube ad told me I should have this for when I'm carrying my um, my X Taurus XD. Spectrum, oh, right? My better. XD or my Taurus Spectrum or whatever, right? Cool, I'll buy that. It showed up. That's here. digging deep. <laughs> oh, right. Okay, so let's take this in a, a slightly different direction and we're going to need Barry's help with this because we're talking about good products, but with the end users that aren't going to really look at how to maximize it. What about bad products with the users that just also assume? Barry, tell me about some experience you had with a, what is it? There's some, there's some brand that we all <laughs> advise against. That we love to hate. That we love to hate. Alien gear. Yeah. No. And, you know, like so many of the points that have been made, um, I mean, I can relate directly to them because, you know, at the time that I bought that holster, I was fairly new to carrying. Um, it was, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, something like that. And <laughs> so going real deep here, I was carrying my XD in it, of course. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, this was, I, you know, I just, I didn't know better. I didn't, I didn't have, you know, gun guy friends to, to consult and talk to and figure out what to do. And sure enough, here comes this ad for alien gear and they say, Oh, it'll work with any gun you've got, you know, just swap out the shells and everything. And I thought, wow, that looks pretty comfy. I like leather. And so I bought it, um, you know, and going back to the whole works for me thing, it, it worked for me for, I don't know, six months, eight months, something like that. And then, uh, yeah, you know, I got into my first, you know, couple of real, you know, legit classes beyond just the, you know, the concealed carry license class here. And uh, I was about two hours into the first class and I realized, oh my goodness, this thing is, this was a bad choice. Uh, it was just, I mean, and this was a super basic, you know, intro to pistol course and, that's, that's how long it took me to figure out that it, it was not a good fit. Um, I actually ended up ditching it halfway through that class and finishing the class with a like paper a bag. $20. No. Yeah, yeah, should have. I should have just thrown it over the berm and been done with it. But uh, I ended up finishing that class with like a $20 Phobos holster from Academy. And that worked better. I mean, it just, it was a better, you know, solution for me for, for that time. Um, and I think even now, like, you know, if I was still carrying that XD, God forbid, um, you know, who knows what, what path I might've <laughs> continued down that way. Um, but, but they cure you. Know, you. It's just that. Yeah. Yeah. The hard way. <laughs> My treatments are finished. 
Yeah. And, and you've Moved experienced on. multiple Alien Gear holsters, though. Yeah, yeah. And th so that was the original, just like the Gen 1, you know, the basic leather, um, the, the you know, exposed hardware on the back that cuts into your hip all day long. Um, and I was doing a, a little, you know, YouTube channel and, and website with some friends of mine. And we, you know, just reached out to Alien Gear and said, hey, uh, you know, we're going to do this review. Um, it's going to go up, whatever. And, you know, to their credit, they said, hey, that's great. You know, we've got this other one coming out. How about we send you this to check out? I said, sure, why not? Um, you know, I, I, I'm always kind of just, I guess, willing to give folks the benefit of the doubt. You know, if one thing they make doesn't work for me, you know, maybe the next one will. And so... Gosh, I think I've got five or six different models and variations and all kinds of stuff from them. And man, like they just, they, they just can't get it. I, I don't know. I mean, I do know part of the problem is, you know, what we talked about earlier, which is at some level, the company knows what people are buying and they're just willing to sell it to them, you know, and it's those you know, low information users who, who don't know better or have don't have the frame of reference to understand that what they're that what they're buying is might not you know be the, the best fit for them. So oh, I've tried so, all kinds of or, the, or that they might never actually encounter the limits of the gear. Yes, right. Never you know. never train. Imagine that. Yeah, well, and so like I said, you know, it worked great for me for a couple of months when I didn't you know wasn't doing any classes or anything when I just you know, put it on and drove to work or went to the store. Yeah, that's fine. But when I start actually using it, having to do draw strokes and, and all kinds of stuff, yeah, just no go. Well, the other end of that, though, is even among, you know, communities that we'd consider educated, there is still some notion that, you know, carrying a gun might be painful or not, or, you know, have some level of discomfort. You know, and Barry, actually, I think you may have been in the in one of the groups where I was trying to engage with somebody back and forth and like, well, it's never. Yeah, I mean, you're never going to not know it's there. And I mean, sometimes you, you may kind of want to say forget, but, you know, it may be, you know, th things may be just right to where, you know, no, it doesn't change any aspect of your life, which is kind of where I've been at for years but there are people that believe that it's some small, you know, there's some small level of pain that you should, yeah. um, you should tolerate. And, and those are the types that like, you know, with some of the alien gear and crossbreed and, you know, designs that are marketed very well, that when you look at them at, and, and you don't think about it or you don't try it, you know, on paper, they look like a great solution. You know, there are a lot of people that buy into that and just kind of, you know, go on with their lives with, you know, hardware digging into their legs and wearing holes through pants and whatever. Well, and I think uh, what Barry's talking about is really important too. It seems like in a lot of realms, not just in guns and holsters and gear, but all over the place, oftentimes people forget where you came from, right? Like, like you know, hey, I carry, like, I legitimately was a dude who was like, the Serpa is one of the greatest holsters ever created. But I also really like this, uh, this Phobos holster. It's all this paddle Phobos. Here's why this is a great holster and all you need to, you know, carry. And then moving into other bad holsters. And not everybody starts that way, but a lot of people who do end up growing and carrying a better holsters, learning why their previous choices were bad. And then they act like, I never did that. I didn't say that shit. I've always been a cool guy. I've always been smart. And I think that makes yeah. it difficult to advocate to other new people to help show them, hey, man, like I used to carry an alien gear holster and you do too. But let me tell you why, like I moved on from that and not doing it from a, hey, idiot, like, like stop carrying that thing. But like, so yeah, I liked it for those same reasons, but, you know, trying to get them to buy into you, right? Yeah. You know, and I, I have... Uh, one video still up on my YouTube channel. That's it's the most downvoted video of all of my videos, <laughs> and it's the Alien Gear one. And it's it's about twenty minutes long, and I, and you know I know half the people Truthful. who watch it don't don't sit through it. Yeah, and it's just you know I just walk through and say this is what's wrong with this. You know this is the clip. This is what is wrong with this. This is the 
the the backing material that they use. Here's what's wrong with that. Here's how it fits. Here's, you know, and, and uh, so many of the people defending it are just, well, you know, if it's coming loose, you just need to throw some Loctite on it. And, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of countering the points that, that are the selling points, you know, like if, okay, this is going to be really easy for me to change for different guns. And then you go Loctiting stuff. You're, you're making it more difficult to do this thing that you want to be easy uh, just for the sake of defending their, you know, what they've spent their money on. Good stuff. Okay. Now I think it's time to pick on someone else who just joined us. <laughs> Tessa. No, finally. You're fairly new to all of this. I'm super new to all this. <laughs> so how did you, how did you go about navigating this, this minefield um, I mean, I had a lot of help. Like if I didn't have any of the help, I would be, I would still be in a sticky holster. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, having help along the way, um, has, I mean, made all the difference. I carried it in, uh, I went from the sticky holster to the tier one, um, and I carried in the tier one for a really, really long time. Um, and I'm just kind of now. Um, the Enigma actually kind of introduced me to like how to better conceal and how to better um, take advantage of those different options and ways to like really get that gun in closer. Um, so I'm just starting to kind of see more of that now. Yeah, yeah. Well, for a basic user, a claw or a wedge, these are not intuitive. It's not off the, you don't look at it and go, oh, clearly it does this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and having someone there to, to kind of help guide, it's invaluable. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, and what you guys were talking earlier about, like, jean ride height, um, belts, and things like that. Um, for the longest time, I, you know, I carried in that tier one for a really long time, and I hated the, the wedge, not the wedge, the claw. Um, and so I just didn't have it on there at all. And, you know, for those nine months, I would look down and see my gun, like just straight like this, no like rotation into me at all. Um, and the Enigma showed me that that could really happen and I could wear whatever the heck I wanted to yeah. uh, and not have to worry about it. So now I know that I can take advantage of the claw and I haven't gone as much into wedges yet, but I know that they're useful for certain things. Yeah. But uh, understanding it's, yeah. It's important. No, it's so, a battle I hear. So, so in your case, um, you know, everything you've posted has been, you know, you've concealed it well. You know, you don't, you don't appear to necessarily need a wedge, and and that's a whole different problem in, you know, in, in how we market things. I've had so many customers in 2020, you know, they'll buy a holster and a pad, mm -hmm. and they'll toss everything on there, and they'll complain about it, and it'll be like, well, I've read this is what I need. And, you know, they'll, they'll present a problem to me and I'll ask them like, well, have you tried it without this? You know, have you, you know, it's like going to a restaurant, like, you know, did you taste it or did you just add loads of salt and pepper to it and then hate it? So in, in, in your case, you know, the, the wed, you know, wedges solve, generally speaking, they'll solve a problem. Um, you know, if you don't have that problem, then, you know, maybe don't add it. Well, and if you don't know that you have the problem, that's something that has been like coming up a lot. It's like, I didn't even know that it was a problem, you know, until it kind of started. I just kind of started to see the different clicks and, and people kind of explain things to me. Um, like I never really, it never really occurred to me that I didn't necessarily want my holster like tipping away from me. Um, and that's something that like, I wanted to get a wedge and try a wedge out to kind of see if I could get it to tip out in different ways. And I think a lot of what you guys are talking about is like, people just don't know to do that. They don't know like what there is to take advantage of. Um, a lot of like what I do with like, yeah, I post stuff, but a lot of what I like do is in my messages. Um, and just the questions that people ask, like they really, like you guys are saying, they really don't have anyone else to go to. And so um, to be that person that's like, yep, I used to carry a sticky holster too. And then I decided I should probably start dry fire practice with it and realize that the holster comes out with the gun when I tried to do this, you know? So um, 
to be that person that newbies, like really newbies feel comfortable saying like, I had someone ask me the other day, do you take your gun out of the holster every time you sit down? And I was like, what? <laughs> the questions that you get, you know? Yeah. Yeah, there's the-, the You don't though? <laughs> the resources for living with a gun attached to your body all day don't exist the same way that the resources for how to shoot a, th you know, sub three second bill drill exist. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of people expect, <sighs> all right. So I think we're just starting to get over the hump in terms of, uh, firearms and gun accessories where you can't buy people are starting to realize you can't buy performance you people have come to the you know the realization and the understanding that you put a red dot on your gun and then you need to train that it's not just you know you don't just attach you don't just purchase and bolt skills onto your gun right uh every uh every accessory that you're adding to your gun is in support of the training that you're already doing. Right. And you're not just going to buy speed. You're not just going to buy accuracy. These are things that you need to train. And I think that we need to start talking about how um, you can't just necessarily buy concealment and comfort or ergonomics necessarily either. You are buying the, a, a device that's going to enable you to use your knowledge to accomplish something. Um, and so people do things like, well, it's got a wing and it's got a wedge. How come it's not doing what I want? Right. It's like, well, you put a trigger job and a dot on your Glock and you still can't score a 65 on a B8 at 25 yards. Right. Right. There's nothing more that you're going to screw to your gun that's going to make that happen aside from maybe a tripod, right? Um, you need to know about the fundamentals of shooting and how to apply them in order to get those hits. We need to start talking to people about what the fundamentals of concealment are and how to apply those strategies in a way that allows you to self-diagnose and then select the tools and equipment that are going to support that at least the beginning of that diagnosis, right? Or, or that, you know, you can get somewhere where you can get part of a prescription and maybe that enables you to then uh, start from a starting place closer to the end state you want to accomplish. And then you, you know, tweak it from there using the, this base of knowledge. And that base of knowledge doesn't really super exist. I mean, I think the fact that, you know, Niche companies, you know, companies like ours who, you know, three years ago were niche are now starting to show up as highly recommended tells us that we're moving the needle in some direction and that there's some amount of knowledge. You know, I, I mean, I'm a lot more people's first holster than I was two years ago. And, yep. you know, so, some of that is, you know, there's some there's some customer service hold handing hand holding that comes with that. Um, and it's a big reorientation in terms of like my personal outlook and attitude to go, okay, well now we're doing hand holding. I was kind of happy for a while to be niche because that meant that like people knew what they wanted, showed up, asked for what they wanted, got it and left me alone. Right. Like that was kind of cool for a little while, <laughs> but, um, I, th I think the amount of outreach and education that we're doing is insufficient as evidenced by the kinds of questions that, you know, Tessa gets and we're far enough away at this point, we're all, you know, 10, 15 years into this, we are far enough away from who, you know, our ability to relate to beginners of today is diminished. 
So I, I, I think I think we need to do some work in reconnecting to who those beginners are and providing them with the benefit of 15 years of um, holster innovation and and uh, concealment theory. You made a comment about adding a red dot to your pistol. And I was thinking about this question about how to end up with the worst holster. And I could approach that question as a maker and say, if I was, you know, what would be the choices that I would make to end up producing the worst possible holster. But on the customer side, I think a lot of people buy, buy holsters and buy gear aspirationally. Oh yeah. And that the, the consequences of that, like the whole idea of buying the reason alien gear sells that big modular kit with all the a la carte add on stuff is because you envision yourself using it someday. You don't, it's, it's probably, you're definitely not replacing five other holsters. You don't have a Miami special, you know, shoulder rig, and you're going to replace it with your alien gear. You just think to yourself, I could see myself using that. That'd be cool to have you, you imagine this thing and then you go for it. And the, the ability to make the case for why a piece of gear is relevant right now to your immediate needs in your current context in your daily life is a totally different approach than marketing. Like you could put this holster on and then a bald eagle will fly by and America and, or, you know, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, a lot of the marketing, um, a lot of the marketing that I see from brands that I consider to be lower tier brands is purely associational. It's not, it's not about products. It, it isn't about performance. It has nothing to do even really with features other than a few ones like easy on, easy off, comfortable, full sweat guard, no extra charge. I'm like, yeah, it's, wow. No extra charge. It's those <laughs> phrases superimposed over a picture uh, clearly taken in the, in the, you know, loading dock of the company's parking lot of some dude defending himself from a carjacker. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Well, that, that kind of marketing is very effective on the kind of person who makes decisions that way. Like nobody looks at a single picture that they see on Instagram of one of my holsters and goes, that really fits with my life, like America. And it's not because I don't love America. It's just because I don't, I want to market the product. I don't want to market my best guess at what you wish your life was like. You need like, more Punisher skulls, more U.S. flags, more eagles. Well, You're sell so the thing everyone. is... It's been amazing to me to see how much certain things, you know, certain characters on Instagram, like the man spot. Are you guys familiar with the man spot? Anyway, the man spot. Yeah. Um, like I'm amazed at the, the amount of traction that these, these brands or these people, and they seem to only be, they're just entertainment. It's purely aspirational. It's like home built lifestyles of the redneck, rich and famous. And like, man, if I had, if I had unlimited sponsors and I had unlimited ammo and I had, you know, a bear 50 cal in my backyard, I'd be living the high life just like this dude. Um, and that, that's very, that's very attractive to a certain kind of customer. And so they come in the door for a completely different set of reasons than I'm used to thinking about when I think about gear that I would ever buy or use. I don't even, I don't even anticipate why yeah, like they I, would make a decision that way. I, I, Have I, you met people? Well, yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I look at some of the marketing and advertising out there and I, I don't know if I could even cynically reproduce it. You know, if, if I were going to be inauthentic and use and, and, and essentially generate a light beer commercial, except instead of, light beer we're talking about a holster and yep. we just use the same format and the same tropes and the same imagery and it and i don't know if i could even do that i, I don't know if i could do that with a straight faced at my most cynical 
Well, and what's interesting, right, is obviously that kind of marketing really works. Those people sell a bunch of stuff. And it's like, well, am I willing to compromise my personal ideals to have an awesome way to put it, right, the light beer commercial? But then also, okay, yeah, I'm going to do that so that I can, uh, you know, sell more stuff, right, because I want to have a nice living. But would that potentially subconsciously cause legit dudes like, Oh, look at the light beer marketing on this guy on like this holster. And maybe that causes legit dudes to now turn away from you, even though you sell a legit product just based upon the marketing. Right. Well, I, know, I, I know that I do it like subconsciously and consciously. I look at certain kinds of advertising and I know that if the advertising lacks a certain substance, I immediately dismiss the product. Like I, you know, I, my first assumption is if there was something good here, they'd they, show me, right. They would show me the good thing instead of the bimbo in the bikini. Right. Like that's, this is clearly like a, a, uh, uh, it's um, a tell. <laughs> yeah. It's a tell. It's like a, um, it's a misdirection. This is the, this is what the magician cool. does. The magician's assistant comes out and makes you look at her while the trick is getting done in the background. And the trick that's getting done in the background here is, Oh, you got sold some piece of shit. You know, like that's that's the trick that they're trying to pull. Well, and I and, and I and I feel like that's pretty transparent. And like any anyone who I would want to be buying my product is necessarily inoculated to that transparency, right? Well, and, and the downside for you know to, to use the internet lingo, right? Normies is to them like America, bald eagles, boobies, like fuck yeah, that is awesome marketing. Normies, Normies love eagles. lifestyle marketing. Oh yeah. Well, you know, what, what gets more views, right? Pressburg doing uh, no fail, like clean and we're all like, that was fucking awesome. Or is it Botkin like with a filter and shooting at 1.25 times speed and not showing hits on steel, right? Like one is objectively like a better thing, but the other one, people like that was sick. I'm going to share this to everybody. Right. Well, one's got electrolytes. That is what plants crave. Yeah. All uh, electrolytes. If, you if say you it start... or do I say it? Brought to you by Carl's Jr. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> now, marketing is terrible, but I think if you see you know, myself, John, or Andrew offering a sidecar, you'll know that we're really hurting for money. So speaking of sidecars, come on, Dan. Come on, Dan. Sidecars. Why? Sidecar holsters suck. So tell us more about this. So if you're not familiar, I've written an article called Why Sidecar Holster, Why Sidecar Style Holsters Suck, if I can say words. How many hate cards did uh, you get on that? um, I got probably the fastest amount of use I've ever gotten. And the majority of the comments were like, well, you're a fat piece of shit. And that's why a sidecar won't work for you. I was, I was like, well, the second part's right, and the first part's kind of right, but those two don't correlate to why the sidecar sucks, right? Like, as a dude who my first carry holster ever was the G-Code Incog with the Mag Caddy for, like, 150 bucks or however much that thing costs, right? And then I moved away from it. Then I came back to a T-Rex arm sidecar and decided that was awful uh, because it pointed my gun at me multiple times, uh, like, at my face, Um uh, as the gun tumbled out of the holster repeatedly. And then year, and then a few years down the road, everybody's was raving about the tier one concealed axes. Like sidecars suck, but I'll put my money where my mouth is. I'll buy it and see if I like it. And again, not a great holster. It, it, you, John, you talk about these in some of your uh, older videos. Uh, I can't remember what the title is, but you talk specifically about sidecars, right? where you've got the opposing forces that are preventing you from getting effective concealment as your belt is coming across on the mag caddy and then uh, on the gun side, on the gun side as well, uh, you know, fucking tactical cod piece. I've got a, you know, a Glock 34 with a name point acro and a surefire X 300 because I'm, I'm a cool guy. Plus my spare like 22 round stendo, I am substantially less able to walk, climb, bend over uh, anything with a sidecar than when I'm carrying that same stuff, plus a tourniquet using a traditional style holster uh, 
separate magazine carrier, separate uh, medical equipment. It, 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 I, I bought into the hype. It's like, oh, sick, gun, mag, all in one. It makes sense when you don't think about it, right? But now you have this immovable mass in front of you. Uh, it was it helped me a lot when I was dating, right? You go in for the hug and they go, oh, like, sorry, that's not me. It's this terrible holster I'm wearing. Tessa so, is cracking up. <laughs> I, I, have, I have a... I have a theory and a narrative and, and I'm, I'm going to lay it out and Andrew and Tom can tell me uh, if I'm right. Okay. So the whole thing started with the incock. And at the time this was when must've been like 2011, 2012 ish. Um, G code was vacuum forming their holsters on CNC molds and then CNC trimming them out while we were still making stuff by hand. And one of the cool things that they were able to do with the incog is when it starts off as a, as a flat piece and then it comes through and the CNC trims it out. And when they fold it, that little tab in the sight channel, starting with it folded fl uh, uh, flat and then trimming it out allowed them to have that little tab for the magazine attachment um, remain flat. And that was something that was technically difficult for us to do if we were making them by hand. Um, that required uh, uh, a, a little extra work, especially if, if you're foam pressing them, right? Um, and the incog was popular mostly because it was cool and they, there was some original novelty in having a magazine attached to the pistol at the time. And they were a hot brand because um, uh, uh, Travis Haley, tra you know, That's Travis Haley was still hot from all the Magpul videos. And then his cachet um, uh, uh, kind of rubs off on, on, on the incog. And that was really popular. We didn't see holsters that were kind of fuzzy on the outside. And we didn't see that kind of um, uh, uh, mag caddy thing going on. And they were also fairly novel in terms of them having made specific clips that were supposedly Negative to it, angle clip. They had the negative angle clip on them that was supposedly um, there to aid in concealment. So that was one of like the first kind of concealment aid things that we saw. And people in their other shops who didn't have access to vacuum forming and CNC trimming were exploring how to reduce uh, how to reproduce a mag caddy in a conventional foam press where you've got a blue gun. You know, that was something that, you know, you could make a sidecar if you had a blue gun and a spare mag and you just put them in your foam press at the same time. Uh, and boom, you've got an attached magazine and gun holster. Now, one of the problems with this is that I don't think it passes a first principles design sniff test. If you were going to design a holster that was going to be uh, ergonomic and concealable and you were starting from zero with no pre-assumptions or preconceptions about what this thing was going to be i don't think that kind of design process would land you at a conjoined pistol and magazine carrier and i believe that this is proven by the fact that continually every new innovation in the sidecar space is an innovation towards making them more flexible, adjustable, and modular, which is working back around to having them be two separate things, right? I think the evolutionary path is to loop back to the beginning where the assumptions about these things need to be attached don't exist. And that's, so, my, that's my theory on this. My thoughts on that have always been, what's the quickest way to increase your uh, you know, cost per sale? And, you know, mo most of the Physically time we attach the upsell. <laughs> yeah. Basically <laughs> force that, force them into it. You have no other choice. And, you know, let's go back to 2011, 2012. Um, I, I don't know when the, when the split with, um, you know, Haley Costa and their current sponsors at the time was, but they were the hottest thing in the world. You know, if we look at the firearms marketing world in that time, at least, you know, the, the segment of the industry we're in, which is still relatively small, 
um, you know, all this stuff, you know, what's common now was new then, and they were jumping all over the hype. So yes, if you could add $40, if you could attach $40 to your radio dollar holster at the time, you know, that's 150% increase, boom, you know, you know, latch on to one of the hottest names in the training world and, you know, cash in when you can. And I, I can't necessarily fault anybody that's, you know, tried to replicate that, you know, most of those people at the time that recognize what was going on have done well for themselves, but, you know, well, yeah. and I think the popularity of the sidecar goes back to what we were talking about with alien gear and everything else is people not wearing the holsters for very long, not doing a ton of serious training with them. Because I, I, I tell you, I can wear, I've done 12 hour car rides with holsters from you guys, uh, you know, Tenacore, Boedemann, et cetera, uh, while I'm going to trainings and stuff like that. And it's not really a problem, but me wearing, I, 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 can't wear a sidecar holster for more than just a few hours and again right the main response is well you're a fat guy that doesn't work it's like no no when i got my first sidecar i was 170 pounds when i enlisted in the air force now i got up to 240 and was still trying to wear sidecars sometimes but even at 240 i'm getting more comfort and concealment out of a standard holster and magazine carrier configuration additionally since guys aren't training very hard with them we're not seeing guys aren't seeing them break and we've all seen where they break either by the wedge or uh excuse me by the claw things like that or in the center uh where there's you know like the t-rex arm cell where it's the one solid piece where you know snaps in half of that fulcrum because of all the pressure that's put on them and in my experience um what really drove me away from sidecars initially wasn't even problems with that it was the inability to get good retention on the pistol I could either make the pistol tight or I could make the mag carrier tight, but the pistol never got very tight at all. And three separate times I'm at home just doing things at home, right? Hey, I'm putting together an Ikea bookshelf and my gun falls out. It's like, all right, first time, that's probably my bad. Maybe I bumped it, take my holster off, tighten the screws down, lock tight them again, um, gun back on. All right, now I've leaned over to pet my dog. Gun falls out again a couple weeks later. It's like, that's weird gun back in and uh, check the screws. Yep. Everything's good. Literally like 20 minutes later, gun falls out again. Last time I'm looking straight down the muzzle as the back, as the uh, back of the slide impacts the ground. I can literally from the lighting, I can literally see like the round in the gun. Thank God I was, had stopped carrying a P320 by that time. Cause I probably would have killed myself in front of my girlfriend and my dog. Uh, Thank you, Glock. I'll never forsake you again. Uh, and then that company specifically reach out, hey, here's the problems I'm having. Here's how I've tried to remedy that. What should I do? And the response, and this is this company specifically, not indicative on the design, is, no, we make our holsters loose so you can pull the gun out faster. It's working as designed, um, like no refunds or anything. But like your holster's fine. It's like, all right, well, done with that one. Let's try something else. And even, you know, when I tried the tier one concealed, I think it's the Axis um, is the one that uses the shock cord. A little bit more comfortable, a little bit more concealable, but it's still a big honking thing in the front of your pants uh, that isn't, I'm still getting reduced capability. In short, I'm still getting reduced capabilities compared to dedicated holster, right? Dedicated holster, dedicated holster. My mag carrier is not within reach. I could probably carry two fucking guns, you know, on a lefty and a righty holster and have more comfort and concealment than I could with a sidecar. And I'd look fucking sick carrying two guns, uh, Max Payne style. I was going to say Gabe's Suarez style, but... Um, yes, also that. Tessa, I'm curious, how did you first end up with a sticky holster in the beginning? Can you walk us through that? Um, so my very first holster was a can-can concealment belly band. Um, and that is like, that's, what's marketed to women is like, it does it look like lingerie, then it must hold a gun. Um, so that's what I wound up with that first. Um, and I put my empty gun in it just to see like, how does this wear? And maybe I can pull the trigger with the gun in the holster. Sure enough, I could. And so I actually never carried in that holster, um, sticky holster, that was gifted to me by a girlfriend who had been carrying as long as she was legally allowed to. 
Um, and so I just took her word for it. And I carried in that for a couple of months while my husband winced every time I put it on. <laughs> um, and yeah, like I said, that ended when I started actually training. So um, depending on the inflection, it could, it could be two very different questions. But um, what exactly were you thinking when you uh, converted to a sale for can can like what was the what was the thought process you were having in the moment that you decided you were going to you know click put you were going to add that to your cart the can can yeah not like oh my god what were you, what were you thinking but like i want to like okay. like re like re really know what about that product and the marketing and the description uh, caused you to believe that it was worth your money in that moment. Like yeah. how did, how did that process work? Yeah. So I think a major part of it was desiring comfort. Um, and the idea that I could potentially carry future tools in it as well. Um, so pocket knife pepper spray. Um, and then in addition to that, I think a major part of it was just that it was pretty for one. Um, it was what was being marketed to me. Um, as soon as I started like, okay, I'm going to conceal carry and started using the Google machine for all of that. Um, that's just generally what started coming my direction. Um, and then furthermore, um, that's really what I had seen women carrying in, which was like a corset looking thing, like the Dean Adams um, stuff. So that's, I think that's what made me initially go there. I also like that I could wear it so low on my hips. Um, so it could actually be inside my jeans and it would never be, you know, above. And then again, the initial thought is just Kydex must be so uncomfortable because it's a hard surface, you know? Um, yeah. So there's, uh, a few factors, right? There's emphasis on comfort. There's the familiarity of, of the design and concept. There is some inertia in the community towards, you know, there's inertia and tradition. And then there's some kind of uh, algorithmic advertising and search result delivery, right? And that's what's working there. Mm -hmm. So... And when you got yours, this is kind of a conversation of, uh, I, I'm not trying to de derail this one, so I'll hold that thought for later, but did you order it online or do you go into a store or something like that and buy, you know, hey, I did my research online, but I bought at the local place or? Online. Okay, was... cool. Yeah. Never mind then, I'll table that other thought. Okay. That's interesting. I've always, I've, and and from there, what will, you know, and, and the sticky holster was a gift. That one was kind of like foisted on you. And were you uh, more skeptical of that after your initial uh, experience with the can can? Um, no, because um, I couldn't physically put my finger on the trigger while it was in the holster and actually pull it. Um, I didn't consider that I could actually get my finger into the actual holster um, and pull it that way. So it felt like when I was wearing it, it felt secure um, again until I actually started working with it and realizing when I draw, it comes out. Um, and I actually did contact Sticky about it and ask them, you know, how do I solve this problem that I'm having? And their solution was that I needed to wear a belt. And at the time it was like, oh my gosh, I never, I don't want to wear a belt. That's, you know, and that was another draw to the can-can was no belts for me. Um, and, and when they, when they offered that as a solution, I thought that's the whole reason I'm using this. So if I'm going to convert to a, wearing a belt every day, then I'm going to wear a Kydex holster. So that's kind of how that transitioned. 
And then from there, you wound up with which Kydex holster? I wound up with the tier one, um, again, because of recommendations. So at the time, that's what my husband had been using. Um, and he ordered one for me. And what I actually wound up doing for the first, probably the first month and a half, I actually took the whole, not the holster, the spare mag carrier off of it and carried with just that single piece um, for the first couple of months and then moved the um, spare mag on there. And something that's interesting about that, now that I'm not carrying in a tier one anymore, at least not with my Glock 48, um, the thing that I found that I liked about the axis slim or just the sidecar style is the bump in my pants was not a bump. It was a like smooth bump, if that makes sense. Right. So, they do, they do balance out in a certain, yeah. in, in, a, in a appearance and lopsidedness way. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's worth note. I think it's worth Sorry to interrupt. I think, I think it's worth noting here that there is a certain body type and a segment of the market that can pull off that design without issue. Um, I think the issues come in with, you know, once you stray even just a little bit outside of that body type, it drastically falls apart. Whereas, you know, what generally speaking, you know, separate pouch, separate holster that everybody suggests that works for everybody. So, yeah, you know, though, I, I think with that, uh, I've read some feedback, spoke to some people that were that perfect body type and they tried out both and then ultimately went, well, screw that sidecar crap. This it's not as effective for me. Yeah. So it may be more comfortable. It might be more, uh, more conducive than for a fat guy. But still, it, it was lacking compared to separate components. Right. So there is some nuance. Like, I mean, if you go if you go to a USPSA match and you look at where everybody has their uh, their primary reload, that's going to be out. You know, outside it's going to be center line. It's going to be slightly angled. It's not going to be in the same place. And what everybody's being sold, no matter who they buy it from, is a mag pouch that's in the same place. So if you set your holster in the right place, and again, um, I don't want to. One of the things I hate about one of the things that's been picked up on really, uh, really well online is efficiency. So if you go and actually Tessa and I were talking about this uh, earlier this week, whenever she was, uh, she said she was being belittled for pulling up her uh, cover garment too high. Um, the hashtag efficiency crowd, you know, wants everything to be absolutely perfect and is so worried about minuscule uh, movements that don't even matter. Um, but if you sacrifice your holster position for your reload position or you sacrifice your reload position for your holster position or whatever, um, you know, things just aren't right. You go to USPSA match and everybody's going to be different, but you know, the production doesn't allow for that. You know, they're all going to be kind of, you know, all going to kind of be the same. So if you are carrying a reload uh, and you are carrying appendix and you are carrying both pen or your reload and your holster appendix, um, you know, something's got to give whenever you go to the, you know, fixed position units. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you might be able to have a holster and a mag carrier that are 100% maximally optimized for speed and efficiency, but you still spend nearly a hundred percent of your time just living with it concealed like you're you're dealing like you are going to spend your time with a <clears throat> appliance attached to your body that's made out of plastic and metal and it needs to be undetectable and you shouldn't have to have substantial access compromises right you know uh obviously carrying guns below your belt line constitutes a substantial compromised your axis but um hyper fixating on efficiency in the context of concealed carry i think winds up you know speed and efficiency are important but they're not you can't assign once you start assigning that too much weight you wind up falling outside the realm of what's optimal for 
concealed carry. You know, you're, you're no longer necessarily within the namesake of the practice. Now you're in, you know, the more you optimize for that narrow focus, now you've just got like, okay, now you're, you know, competing with a cover garment. You know, you're sort of m- moving into that kind of uh, competition space, I think. Um, now, that's a pretty fast cycle to go from a a can can to a, a tier one. What what time frame did that take place in? Um, maybe two months, three months at the most. That's a pretty rapid turnaround for um, and 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 how much of that was waiting for your holster to get built? Hmm. Yeah, probably. I yeah, probably like a month of it. That's what their turnaround time is. So yeah, so uh, that's a really fast cycle to get into something that is at least safe and capable. Um, how yeah. a lot of people don't get there much slower than that. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's it? What's it like out there? in terms of the information space and the uh, environment in which you made those discoveries and leapt in the space of a month from something that was um, essentially uh, marketing driven, unsafe accessories to something that's at least safe and practical, if not, you know, pretty decent. What do you mean by like, the jump, like what is the, I, I don't like totally understand. Oh, geez. I mean like, okay. So, so for example, for me back in like 2008 or nine or whatever, when I first started getting into guns, um, if I wanted to learn about guns and stuff as a new gun owner, I would kind of like wind up, on YouTube searching for stuff and watching a lot of videos by people whose credentials I couldn't really validate and looking around and shopping around for stuff that looked kind of similar, but maybe I could afford. And, and I had bought, you know, God, I I bought so many just kind of like meh holsters. And then I'd go, okay, well, you know, I need to get something nicer. And I bought a hundred dollar leather holster. And I said, I, and, and my assumption was that, well, you know, I don't know that much about guns. I don't have any mentorship here necessarily. Um, uh, if it's a hundred bucks, it's going to, of course, give me better results than the $50 one. And at the time I bought like a hundred dollar leather outside the waistband holster. And like, I never wore it cause it printed like crap. And, you know, like, I wasn't in a space where I had a whole lot of information. Well, I mean, it was, you know, like the the information space was better than it was, you know, 10 years previous to that, but I still didn't really know how to navigate it or where to go or what kind of communities to find or even how they, how to find them or even that they existed. Mm -hmm. Right. So what did you discover in the space of that, two months beyond just what was available to buy. Mm. So like what kind of, what made me make that transition? Like what information made me go from this to that? Right. And, 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 and how did the gun world open up to you as you, as you, as you move through that? Hmm. Well, for me, I did, I had my husband walking me through a lot of it. And in those, those first two holster decisions, um, that was him kind of, okay, like these are things that you say you want to use. Like I would, I wish that you wouldn't, but here we are. And, and, um, when I realized like, you know, he had said to me, he'd put those little like, you know, seeds in my head as I'm dry firing. Like, do you notice that your holster's coming out? Like that's, you know, that's obviously not okay. 
um, okay, but I'm, I'm ready to, I'm ready to have a kayak soul shirt. Like I, I see the value in it now. I see that I need, um, at the very least clips, like holding on to my pants. Um, and you know, this is the holster I see you put on every single day when you leave the house and you can seal it well all day long. So for me, it was just exposure to, you know, the person that I'm living my life with um, showing me that they could conceal day in and day out with this. And so it was the next most natural jump, um, was for me to, you know, the last two things that I made these decisions on my own, I regret these decisions and I want to move on to something else. Um, and he kind of presented that to me, um, as far as like the gun world surrounding that, like time and space that I was in, um, there was a lot of Facebook groups and social media is where I think I was getting a lot of information from. And in those groups that are mainly like that were mainly beginners surrounded by women, um, the goal was like, it's so good that you're just carrying a gun at all. So there was never any guidance. Like I never had any guidance from those groups and those women, um, so yeah, like I said, he, my husband was kind of the one that was like, this, this is what I'm going to have you like start with. And it worked for me. Um, I don't know when and why I made the transition away from using the access slim, but that was more like my own moving away from it. What was your, uh, what was the intermediate, what, was there an intermediate step between my stuff and the access? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I still use some of those, um, eclipse, uh, holsters was kind of the jump in between. And, but I would say like your holster has been, has actually like become the EDC kind of thing. Like I never carried the eclipse every single day. It's kind of supplemental for me. It's a necessary supplemental piece. Um, but yeah, your, your holsters have been more of a like, okay, this is not my everyday option. So that's the tier one was an everyday, the hitchhikers an everyday, the eclipse is supplemental. So I, I think with what you just said, there's also something in, in there. Um, so if the hitchhikers become your, your everyday, you still have a use for something else. So you're still not at, you're still not a person that with what you do, you can use just a single product. No. So. I think I could, but I don't need to. And it's nicer to have multiple options. Well, I think, so, so that, that, that's a really good point. And I think some people get a little bit lost on the options thing, right? Like, like some people like, here's your carry gun and you should only ever carry one thing. And then you have some people where they've got, you know, rotate Hey, I've got like 15 different pistols and I carry each one every other day of the month. Right. Or it's like, all right, I'm going to carry my Glock 34 and then my Glock 17 and my Glock 19 FN 509 MMP, whatever. But like, and then the, the counter that's like, no, you idiot. You should only ever carry one gun, but, and, and, and I'm not super familiar with your, with your situation. Right. But having different guns for different contexts, whether it's, Hey, I'm dressing like this because of the weather or, you know, me and my significant other going out somewhere nice to eat and I have to wear a little bit, you know, tighter fitting clothes or I'm going somewhere and I'm not supposed to have a gun, but fuck you, I'm bringing a gun. So instead of carrying my, like, like and, and people get like bamboozled when I say this, but my two main carry guns are either a Glock 34 with an aim point acro on it, like a big ass gun. And I carry a spare mag, so I've got 40 rounds of nine millimeter on tap. Or I'm carrying a Smith and Wesson 351 PD, which is a uh, airweight J frame that shoots 22 Magnum. Like I've got a seven shot 22 Magnum revolver that weighs 12 ounces loaded. And they're like, "What? Those are so radically different. How do you even do that?" It's like, well, ones for the like every day, like the Glock, how I dress and what I do for work, I can carry that. But sometimes, like, I have to have a, 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 the small boy, right? And that's okay. Um, and then figure out good holsters, right? Like you've done, right? Like, hey, what's the holster I'm going to do with this, you know? So, 
So, um, you had some mentorship by way of your, your, your husband and, and some, and some of it was kind of like a, a gentle suggestion, like, Hey, maybe your gun should be, you know, maybe your gear should be safe when you're dry firing, you know, like <clears throat> what, um, what information space was he occupying at the time? You know, like wh wh where was his hat at, head at what community, you know, we're all here kind of, you know, 10 years later and this world has grown uh, around us in a certain way. And I don't know what it's like to come in from scratch into the, in today's day and age. Like that's not an experience that I have. So like what, what's his world like, how did, how did he kind of come into contemporary gun culture? Like, you know, What's the, what's the frame of reference? <laughs> yeah. So actually, this is probably going to sound kind of funny, but actually you, John, were, was kind of where he like got his start. So you were, he's like nostalgically told me this story a couple of times, um, but he was really into holster making when he was in high school. Um, so he would watch your videos. And oh, so, so he's got like, like, like a childhood of, of, of gun culture? So yes and no. So he, his entire family, no. Like, you know, shotgun in the safe because, because, but not like gun culture in his family. He was, you know, the 10 year old that was like, mom, dad, like I want a gun and competition looks cool. So like, let's do this. And they were really supportive of that. Wow. Um, so that, yeah, that was kind of how he got his start. And, and, and what he got into like making holsters as a teenager. Yeah. So in high school, he like, yeah, he liked tinkering. That's kind of like how he explains it is like tinkering was his thing and, um, cars was not his thing. Guns were his thing. So he would tinker with holsters and, um, make them. And then he got into competition and, you know, was making his holsters and his Mac carriers for competition and, um, yeah. And a lot of that, a lot of that was watching you. So no shit. yeah. Yeah. So he kind of, he kind of followed as I understand it, he kind of followed your path as you continued. He continued to like follow, not in the holster making process, but, um, as far as like the, the space and the people that you were associating, um, yourself with, he was able to kind of like pull from them as well. Oh, that's cool. That's good. That's really good. Yeah. So that, that influenced him, which ultimately wound up influencing me, which is actually really cool when you think about it. Like, you know, you got your start, you connected with all these people and little did you know, <laughs> you had this, you know, this other person kind of following along and watching. Oh, well, it's just occurring to me that the 15 year olds who are watching my YouTube videos are married adults now. <laughs> All right, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but like, if it makes you feel any better, everybody's like, yes, I don't know. You're like 34, 40, something like that. I'm like, dog, I just turned 27. Like, <laughs> please, I haven't been carded since I was like 17 and it hurts. <laughs> yeah, people were asking me how my divorce was going when I was 17. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I, Rough so, day at the mill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I spent a lot of time around brand new shooters. I teach a little bit on the side and virtually 99% of my people, like either I've never handled a gun before, or I've never even had like, I don't even have my concealed carry license yet. And so I get to like experience a lot of the, th this kind of goes into like the information space, right. Uh, where people are getting their information from. And a lot of it is kind of the obvious stuff. Like I searched gun reviews and like truth about guns and the firearm blog popped up because they're like some of the two biggest sites, right? Or I got on YouTube and I looked to see who had the most views and this guy has a million subs. So he must know what he's talking about, right? Like, like, like I can't tell you how many people have been like, have you heard of this guy, Paul Harrell? He's got great information. You know, this ammo is great. He shot at some like a slab of ribs with it. 
And it's like, well, shooting groceries isn't a ballistic test. (laughs) Yeah. And and, and he's like, yeah, there's this guy like Caleb Giddings who said a thing and he's an idiot because he's got like 20,000 subs and Paul's got like over a million. So obviously, or, or, you know, Hickok 45 liked this gun. And so it must be great. It's like, I love Hickok. I wish he was my grandfather, but like, I don't know if what I, what he does, I'd call a review, right? Like, like, all right, let's shoot the gong. I hit the gong. This is a very comfy video, but it's not the same as, you know, other people that are more kind of in this space uh, doing reviews, but it, much like with the holsters, it's kind of that lack of context to know what's good data, what's bad data and what's infotainment right um like i love demolition ranch's video on like the 10 high points that he filled with like concrete and like gorilla glue and stuff and they still worked but that doesn't mean you should carry a high point over like a glock or like a smith and wesson sd9 ve or a ruger you know whatever right not a they were able to get a high point to work oh you you know what if you check out my review of the High Point JHP 45, it worked with everything I put through it except Fiocchi. Uh, but I still wouldn't carry one. I shot a USPSA match with it, and it was hilarious. What I would do is uh, vacuum seal a High Point in a food saver and leave <laughs> it in the shower. Yes, that's the shower guy. Somebody now, get elephants one of these. I, I wonder if, if we're eventually going to hit a point where some critical mass of people – get kind of savvy about um search results and no you know i'm kind of coming to a point where i'm recognizing that the top hit most clicks highest rating most purchases you know if i if i look up something chances are the thing at the top is either paying to get there mm-hmm. is doing something um, sophisticated with SEO to arrive there or has enough is, is, is kind of like harnessing the uh, low information energy of a broad enough numerous base enough uh, numerous enough base of users to arrive there algorithmically and so like maybe the first hit isn't the best hit and i and i wonder how long it's going to take for 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 people to kind of get savvy about that in terms of like internet search results well whatever happened when I shop on Amazon, I don't go with the first thing that it says because it clearly says this is something paid. Okay, I don't care about that. I don't want to use that. Well, the, the, no. there, there's some of that. And then other things that wind up first are things that some... I don't know. You, you can get the dumbest 50% of the population to all buy something. You know, and that's 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 kind of like a like a like a, a, a shitty thing to say. Um, but then you wind up, you know, doing the math, like 50% of people can't be wrong. Well, y- yeah, they, they exactly. Most should. assuredly they are absolutely <laughs> fucking wrong. Right. But it, it's, it's hard. <laughs> now I'm hungry for the McRib. <laughs> um, the McRib is a glorious sandwich. Don't talk shit on the McRib. Well, Matt oh, just no, held up his XD. No, so, see, this is what you do um, with your holsters. It's like the McRib, and it's like um, like new Coke, right? Discontinue the Enigma, discontinue all your stuff, release some shitty products for like a month, and then guess what? It's back. And then everybody will shit their pants and just do that in a cycle like every nine months, right? And it'll new Enigma. Sales. Yeah, right? Enigma Zero. Enigma clear. I was going to say clear enigma. (laughs) Enigma with lime? The spicy chicken nuggets are back, and I'm excited. But um, The problem with the McRib is people think it's actually ribs. It's not even fucking pork. It's just good. It's a sauce delivery system. (laughs) And it was just recently available not too long ago. Soylent green as people. Well, look, when you say... (laughs) 
<laughs> mechanically separated swine. Nobody wants to buy it anymore. <laughs> I'm just, I just wanted to say the machine's working. I read the jungle. I remember this. It's, it's, it's not a machine as much as it's a, 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 a power washer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think I think we're probably getting off track, and it's it's eleven thirty oh. here, and I know you East Coast people are. It's like it's after midnight. So actually, what's kind of funny is one of the guys uh, teachers I had in high school that got me into engineering. Uh, one of the things he would set, he would uh, stress the first day of the school year every year was what the hot dog uh, ingredients listed and mechanically separated chicken was was his favorite thing to mention that you know if you want to shortcut it that's why i'm an engineer today <laughs> and 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 when do you buy your own chicken separator tom i don't have one yet is that on the bucket list shop equipment can you ex- can we can we technically expense that i could find a way have a lot of employee lunches to make in order to justify <laughs> an in-house chicken separator <laughs> That's something you could buy online. I'm gonna Google it. You can get used ones on eBay, but I'm not. I'm not sure. Do you about, need the, do you you need the, the one that shop? does 200 you... chickens a minute, or do you want like the hobby-sized one where you turn the crank to do the mechanical separation? Yeah, Andrew's got space for a new chicken separator. Oh, absolutely, we do. Yeah, and and the three phase. Yes, indeed. I mean, I I hit one of my major life goals this year which was I now own a forklift. Like, oh, does your insurance I company know you send own you a forklift? A... Say what? Does your insurance I... company know you own a forklift? <laughs> <laughs> they My do what? now. You have a Carhartt beanie. <laughs> I don't know. I, I definitely have a, a hundred orange, orange generic one that I got from Walmart. It's not even, it's not even a Carhartt beanie. It's just a beanie. That's going to get, they were, they were sold out on Amazon. I that was something I did want to send you for Christmas was a uh, was a tan Carhartt beanie, but they were sold out on Amazon, so I was unable to send that. That's just about the ultimate gray man accessory here in uh, Southern Indiana. I'm not sure what it says, but it says a lot of it, and everyone sort of blends in. So um, there was one other thing, John. Your comment about the top results on Google searches. It's like people saying, yeah, don't eat at the touristy restaurant that's right by the airport. Go like, right. go off the beaten path a little bit and find a local dive and actually have some authentic food. Right, eat, um, where, the, eat where the natives are eating. Yeah, there's yeah. definitely, I operate that way when I'm looking for things. I know there's going to be a bunch of gamed, algorithmed and or sponsored stuff that's going to rise to the top. And it's just like, you just have to skim all that garbage off the top and then drink the water that's underneath. Um, but that gets increasingly difficult to do in a, in an apps and social media environment where things aren't ranked the same way. Like everything has equal validity in the newsfeed. And it's, de- it's deliberately presented in such a way that if you're just sort of scrolling along, it's very difficult to tell what is just garbage and what actually might have some real back end to it. Yeah. And that's frustrating. I just remembered something that we needed to cover on tonight's episode. And it was something that causes Tom to lose his mind about. I made a list. Oh, good. So for what, what I think inspired this episode was the fucking shake test. Mm -hmm. You know, was the, was the YouTube byproduct of, you know, we've got to film a 90 second to five minute video talking about things and, you know, hashtag retention is something that matters. So we need to find a way to show this on a YouTube video and, um, you know, doing this, you know, is somehow important. So to some degree it is and some, some degree it isn't. So like Daniel had an experience of, you know, bending over to pet his dog and, and his gun creating a potentially lethal circumstance by falling out. Right. Or, you know, people also, you know, 
we mentioned earlier in the episode, struggle with the mechanics of going to the restroom with their gun. And as soon as you undo your belt, you create a circumstance where the gun can tip out in a certain way, right? So the ability for the holster to retain the gun is important. Now, the question is how do people who don't, who, who have set themselves up as experts enough to deliver a review, but don't actually know anything that they haven't been told directly by that holster's manufacturer, how do they demonstrate sufficient retention without the shake test? Now, Honestly, I think they I, can't. I mean, I it, think the shake test is kind of dumb too, because, you know, you should be doing, I think it's more appropriate to do other stuff, you know, like do some jumping jacks or do a few burpees. And that's a little more representative of what happens with the gun in relationship to the holster on a moving dynamic human body. Like shake test is, you know, whatever. <laughs> Well, so there's there's something that was posted um, about somebody having an issue with a weapon mounted light holster, and they're like, "Well, if I hold it like this, you know, the gun falls out." And it's like, "Well, hold on, you know, the gun has a built-in thing that allows you to grip it. You know, things are falling apart. Why?" So I can do this with this holster, and then I can do that with this holster. Right. What am right. I, what am I, what am I telling anybody? Well, and that's, you know, the kind of low information thing, right? If somebody, you know, let's say people are valuing it, right. You know, Hey, there's a big difference between me going like, okay, never mind. Retention's high enough on this. So it's not going to fall out. Right. But sometimes if you're not holding it all, it'll still fucking fall out. Or I can punch the shit out of this, you know, for the sake of my video, right? Okay, whoever gave me a holster to pimp and they gave me money and I know people don't want this to fall out. So maybe I'm not even being nefarious about it. Maybe I'm not even just, maybe I'm just not thinking about it. Yep, I pinched it, doesn't fall out. Oh, you know, whatever. Um, you know, I like my patented handstand shimmy method. Uh, I was talking about the group, you know, that's a little bit too sexy for this hour of television. That's that's on the OnlyFans? Oh yeah, yeah, it's a tragedy. Sign me up. <laughs> so what other methods or other procedures or techniques or whatever are you seeing people share as this is legitimate. This is how you figure out if something's good. That's just bullshit. Well, so what's the holster supposed to do? It's supposed to keep the gun there in place for how you intend to use it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, put it in your pants, you know, make sure it's unloaded, safe, blah, 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 all that stuff. And, you know, do things where you might imagine uh, drawing a gun. One of the things actually was in John's group I shared, which is I believe what you saw, Matt, was there were a couple, uh, you know, solo drills for jiu-jitsu on the wall. You know, what's the worst possible case to do is, you know, hang upside down and have the gun fall out. But, you know, one of the things, well, let's look at a weapon on a light. It's not going to show up very well, but, you know, the belt on a weapon mount light holster is going to influence it greatly. You know, one of the issues with weapon mount light holsters is if you're wearing them and you cinch down your belt too tight, or you set it for, you know, standing at the range because everyone wants to have that awesome one second draw time. Uh, and then you go and you sit down, the gun's locked up. Or if you're, you know, you're inverted somehow, you know, the gun's locked up. So you need to have it loose enough to be able to handle that. Um, so one of the videos I posted was just some uh, solo wall drills where, you know, put your feet up against the wall and very easy to manipulate yourself upside down, you know, something like that, you know, you can do, anybody can do anywhere in their house or, you know, if you don't want to put your feet on the wall, you can do it outside, you know, relatively easy, you know, that's probably the most extreme circumstance is going to be somehow you find yourself upside down, you know, carrying a pistol you know, no matter what, you're going to have some amount of, you know, belt pushing in, body pushing out, clamping down. Yeah, I mean, realists, I think that, and like John was talking about burpees and stuff like that, some sort of, to use the tactical term, dynamic movements, uh, you know, shit right. that you might experience in your life. And even, 
you know, we're very focused on the, if I get in a fight, I want to keep my gun on me, but I live in the Midwest and it gets snowy and icy. I don't want to slip and bust my ass. And then my pistol flies across the Walmart parking lot because, you know, I had bad retention or I have, you know, my niece and nephew are here and they bump, you know, my gun for whatever reason, or, you know, maybe as I'm holding one, their foot catches it. And I don't want it to like start to pull the gun out of the holster because their foot got under, you know, got caught underneath the grip or something like that. Now, that doesn't mean to have your gun well, so, so, get it out of the goddamn holster, you know, right? Like that. Oh, my God. But, right. I mean, and, and the other thing is, you know, so, so if, what if you, we're concerned about, you know, doing the routine things that might cause your gun to come out, um, you know, like using the restroom, you can use your restroom at home. You know, if 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 you want to determine whether or not your retention is adjusted and the holster is set up well enough that you don't have to necessarily worry about that gun coming loose as you perform the necessary functions required for you to live, you can go to your own restroom with your unloaded gun and make those determinations by essentially duplicating the experience that you would have out in a public restroom. Right. And you don't need to do a (laughs) shake test you can just do the things that you're going to do in the safe confines of your own home. You don't need to come up with some artificial test that doesn't necessarily describe what the gun and the holster are going to do. You can just wear your gun in your holster on your body and do the things that you're going to do. It's 2021 in the brave new world of bathroom dry fire. Yeah. (laughs) Well, by the way, how good are Dots pretzels, Matt? Absolutely amazing. Oh, they're like loaded with MSG and they're completely perfect. MSG is amazing. Oh, it's the best. Like it's, it's the only flavor you actually like. (laughs) Well, so (laughs) no, it's it's... all the flavors you actually like. The, the, the thing I missed most about, uh, about shot show this year was going to cut and getting wagyu and getting you know natural umami with the a5 yeah mom go ahead john i was gonna say you can you can order that on the line i'm I, craig, Doug, craig douglas has a, a coupon code for wagyu beef got a fucking meat sponsor yeah i want a meat sponsor <laughs> Damn it. I, I, isn't that an only fans <laughs> right <laughs> i've harassed him about that so he's got you know, I've had Viberg boots before he did, he, although he doesn't have a coupon code for Viberg. You know, I did crowd cow because of you. And then, you know, he's the one that lines up with the fucking coupon code and, you know, free meat and whatever. Well, I mean, he's clearly more handsome and sophisticated than us. So I don't <laughs> clearly him that at all. Clearly. Yeah. No, but uh, so, so back to the, uh, the shake test. Um, so the best way to test the actual as worn retention will be, you know, understanding the waist shape is dynamic. So as you move, it's going to expand and contract and whatnot. Um, the, and I've seen it from, from movies my wife watches um, that I secretly enjoy um, is, you know, whenever they have a scene where ladies trying to, you know, wear pants that she can't quite fit into lay down on the bed and, you know, that's how you can get them buttoned. Well, so the, you know, the smallest your waist is going to be is probably going to be laying down on a bed. So if you want to test the retention, take your unloaded gun and see how it does, you know, laying down on a bed. You know, everybody has a bed. So, you know, that's relatively easy. See how that feels and, you know, understand what the holster has to do. The holster, you know, holds the gun in a, you know, fixed location um, how fixed it is, is kind of relative, you know, um, there are some people that, that want, you know, the belt attachment to be absolutely fixed and that's fine. There are some people, uh, like myself that like, you know, a, a small amount of float afforded in the belt attachment. So, you know, soft loops that allow it to move with the body slightly, you know, that's fine. Um, either way, no matter, you know, if you go with one or the other, um, you know, laying down in your bed, it's going to be the loosest. It just needs to, you know, not pop out. So, 
you know, lay down on your bed and, you know, does the gun feel like it's going to fall out on its own? Uh, if so, you've probably got a problem. If not, it's probably okay. And then everything else beyond that, you know, there is, there is something to be said for a nice um, snappy feel uh, something that's, that's really interesting. Um, it's popped up in classes numerous times is draw times on uh, certain safari land holsters or certain high retention hol- or certain snappier holsters where people really jam down and really get a good master grip for something that like the guns just like barely held there. Um, you know, there is something to be said for a holster that has a slightly snappier feel to where you really have to have a, a perfect master grip for it to come out. But beyond that, you know, how, how my holster is currently set that I've worn through, you know, ECQC, EWO, um, various, uh, you know, we have a really good um, sustainment group for shipworks type material. Here, you know, the holster I have, it's, I've not touched it in years and, you know, the gun's not falling out. Um, you know, it just works. And if you go and try to subject it to some YouTube test, it's going to, you know, it's going to fly out. You know, you just showed John with a, uh, with an orange gun that doesn't have the weight of 17 rounds and a steel slide to it that you could shake it out if you wanted to. You put a real gun in there, you could most assuredly, you know, wiggle it a little bit and it's going to fall out. Yeah. Uh, and, but that's the sense. So, oh, go ahead. I would say it's just not reality. Yeah. So, so this kind of combines what you were just saying, Tom, and then what John was saying earlier, right? Hey, practice the thing that you're actually going to do. If you're in a community where you do, you've got bros that do jujitsu or whatever, um, or even just like, Hey, like, bro, you want to come over and like wrestle, like put pants on wrestle. Right. And you know, blue guns are relatively expensive for most people, but like the Blackhawk stuff isn't exactly the same, but I got this like 20 bucks. And if this stays in your pants, you know, a real gun, maybe not right. What we were saying, it's got the additional weight of, you know, loaded magazine, but if you're having issues, you know, as you're tooling around with a buddy, right. You know, this could at least be a rough hack, you know, all right, well, I had these problems with this. <laughs> Would that potentially be amplified by the live gun? Cause you homies probably not going to want you rolling around with them with a live gun. Even if you cleared it, cleared it, cleared it again. Okay. It's still cleared. Right. But doing something somewhat realistic, you know, and then go back to what you're saying before, you have the solo jujitsu drills as well. Um, but I mean, I've got a handful of buddies it's like, all right, we're gonna go wrestle and like throw a our gun, you know, blue guns in the holsters and see how that goes. Oh, that didn't go so well. Time to try something else. Before we continue, we need to let Tessa go. It's it's time for she has an early morning. Uh, well, I think go. it's 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 bedtime here too. Oh, I'm pretty cooked. Suck. Both of you suck. I gotta so, get back to machining Tom's molds out in the shop. I still got the CNCs fired up. So, and uh, <laughs> I work. I'm gonna be working graves for the next couple of days, so I'm gonna be awake. But I saw you drinking Monster and eating dots. You're gonna be. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. You're you're gonna be cruising. <laughs> Refrigerators day. right here, just full of them. Um, Tessa, thanks for being on with us. Where can people find you? Um, what do you want to plug? Well, I, I will plug because you're asking me to, but good, good. <laughs> um, my Instagram is armed and styled. Um, and I'm kind of just getting started on YouTube and it's the same name. And then you can find my website on both of those places. So cool. Yeah. Thank you. And I figured out a way to get you on. Yes. Yeah, I noticed that that didn't go unnoticed there. <laughs> I was going to ask about it. It's, you know, Matt and I have talked a few times and it's, it's nice to see you on and, you know, back to some of the stuff that we've talked about, you know, kind of in private. Um, it's, there is a place for what you're doing and, you know, it, you are in a position to where people should probably hear what you're going through. Yeah. So, so, so don't be afraid of it. Just, you know, do what you're doing and, you know, solve the problems naturally and learn about them and document it and share it. That's, that's the goal is to just kind of own it. <laughs> so, yeah. Very nice to talk to Tessa. Yeah. It was nice to meet you guys. <laughs> Have a great night. We'll see you. 
Okay, John, I guess you can talk now too. plug whatever you want. Come see us at filsterholsters.com. Oh, wait, you're Filster? And join us at the Filster Concealment Workshop Facebook group where we discuss in depth and uh, at the personal and individual level all of the things that we've talked about uh, this evening where we uh, help people uh, uh, learn about how to reduce, how to, you know, how to leverage the mechanics to reduce the signature of their firearm. That's the new tagline. Nice. But, uh, oh man, it's, well, and it's also, been so long since my last cup of coffee. <laughs> and also, I can, see, you, I can see how tired Andrew is. Poor guy. And also you Long have a, a little yeah. community too on the uh, forum. Yep. Uh, yes. Also, uh, we are establishing and developing our uh, potential long-term social media exit strategy. Uh, the concealment workshop is duplicated on the marvelous primary and secondary forums. Thanks to the endless generosity of our host, Matt Lanfair. And uh, as, as Facebook screws us up yep. with like, I don't even think they're malicious. It's just so clearly inept. Like the more we moderate these Facebook groups, the more we see them catching stuff that, you know, like flagging content. And I'm like, they flag this for nudity. It's a picture of someone's knees. Like there's no way, like the, the only thing malicious that's happening here is the hubris to think that they're capable of moderating anything at this scale with these tools. Like, that's the that's the only thing that I, like f yes facebook is censoring us and i think they're censoring everybody cuz they don't know how else to do anything so uh we're trying to make sure that we've got some kind of out in case something happens and there's no possibility of appeal and we have to deal with the completely opaque black box system of getting your life back from facebook you can join us at the primary and secondary forum where we, you know, on the people's free internet. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, for now, you can also find us on YouTube at the Philly EDC YouTube channel until that gets disappeared off the internet. And it's important to maintain those connections with our communities. 100%. Because imagine what, what it would be like. We wouldn't be able to have these discussions. I'd be like the 90s. That's right. We'd have to, we'd have to read Soldier of Fortune again <laughs> yes babe. yeah you yes. you're one of those guys who read soldier of fortune for the articles right john <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> well andrew do you have to take off too yeah i've got some more machining to do and it's almost 1 a.m here so so i need to jet what are you gonna plug i can't imagine so holsters or anything like that. we we don't have a lot of social media presence it feels like lately i've not been posting much instagram is my main channel at henry holsters um, we do have a youtube channel we've got a variety of things there some some shop tours some information stuff mostly geared toward holster makers but still some i think some useful short explainer videos about holster terminology basic attachment types other things that are relevant to a person who's trying to get oriented for new gear um, and you can find us at henryholsters.com. We don't have a thriving community. We're kind of the person behind the curtain in a lot of different places, but you've, even if you've never heard of us before, you've probably run across something we've touched. So yes, thanks for having me out. It. Good to be on my yeah. first podcast. Enjoyed it. About time. Yeah. 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 Well, well, I'll come, I'll come on next when your STI finally shows up. Oh man. I'm, I'm all for that. I just, oh, oh, 2022. Soon. I hope. Did you, did you order one, Andrew? No, I did not. No, I did not yet. Yeah, I thought I about it. And then I've got so many other things on my plate right now. I'm just like, Oh, yikes. And who's got ammo to shoot anything, <laughs> you know? 
I had this I had this crazy dream a couple of days ago that I ended up at a gun show and I ran into Tamara Keel and we were like trying to figure out how to convert all these revolvers over to fire 40 Smith and Wesson because that was the only ammo that was there. <laughs> this is a this isn't a dream. This was real. I was, yeah, I was gonna say was that. <laughs> and, and I woke up and every I, Ruger 10 millimeter revolver you could find <laughs> and all the 10 millimeter moon clips and you had to and you had to knife fight Caleb Giddings to get the last. 10 millimeter gun. Oh man, it was amazing. Yeah. Like I'm like, I'm they make gun 10 show with ten millimeter Why am I looking at wheel guns? And she's like, they've got 40 Smith and Wesson. I'm like, we're doing this. <laughs> this is the most plausible dream I've ever heard. <laughs> I was, I'm like, I, I woke up. I'm like, where? Are, whose house is this? Who's? What's what's going on? Take me back. I don't want to. <laughs> I, I got. I, I woke up from the Matrix or something. It was. Did you it was wind very, up very... a 20 tap in Broad Ripple, uh, Indiana? Also. Yeah. No, not quite. Not you, quite. But it was it was no, one of those very weird some, some 357 SIG revolvers. <laughs> if anybody would have those or know where they would be found, Tamara Keel is the person who would. She's got one but in her safe. She's probably got one in her sock. She's just got one. <laughs> but it was it was very, very funny. So thanks for having me on. Good to talk to you guys. Have a great night. We'll see you Take later. Care, bud. Bye. All right. I'm signing off to you guys. Good night. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me, as always. Oh, yeah. Good to see you guys. So, Tom, now that the adults have left. My list. Yeah, we still haven't even touched it. Oh, really? Do you want to save it for another show or do you want to keep on going? Um, and probably to another show, honestly. Okay. Uh, but, like, the, the one thing that pops up with leather holsters in – in various groups is like, oh my God, you can see through the holster. Yeah. You know, how are you pulling the trigger on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think I'd be able to reach the trigger. There's stuff no. in the way. Right. But like, you know, the internet is just awful and they would shit talk this all. Well, they have, they do. They would shit. Talk yeah. And it's like, yeah, you know, I can touch the trigger. I can't do anything with it. I can put my finger through it. I can't do anything with it. Well, I, you know, though, if you had a, a wire coat hanger and you bent it up, then you could act, activate the trigger. No, no, those are just for AR lowers. Oh. We don't do anything else with those. No Ooh. wire hangers. Yeah. So, Tom, I th do you think it would be a bad idea to explain the relationship with Henry and Darkstar and Filster? Because I think it's a it's so, really cool. So Andrew Henry is um, so let me go back. Uh, I know he started sometime around 2008. Um, he was actually doing useful hybrid holsters, which you know, as far as uh, you know, a lot of the stuff we've talked about, um, hybrid holsters are you know, or what alien gear and uh, crossbreed and lots of other brands make that on paper makes sense until you actually use them, you know, in, in short term, they make sense. Um, he made a dual layer hybrid holster, which was nothing more. Now this is, this is slightly different. This is a five shot leather SME appendix built holster with a, a, a trailing lever, uh, a, a wing, um, but Andrew made a leather holster that had, um, or um, I believe a, a dual layer Kydex shell that had a full leather backer. So whenever you talk about, you know, the, the idea of best of both worlds, he actually had the useful, you know, long-term durable best of both worlds. You know, he wasn't sacrificing the Kydex shell and he was doing a good uh, leather backer. Um, but Andrew is a, I believe he went to, went to school for um, some form of uh, instrument making. You know, so he, you know, he's at one point in time made guitars and basses. Uh, and as somebody who collects more than plays, but, uh, you know, at some point in time, I'd like to swindle him into making me a guitar. Um, actually, I think of a turn. You can say I got a bass there. Um, 
but you know he comes from a woodworking background and a lot of the manufacturing processes that are state of the art are adapted from woodworking and and various avenues like that and he's probably responsible for a good bit of them um but what andrew does and and what he did was at some point in time he you know took the risk and bought a you know a real you know adult cnc machine not a router um and he does a lot of the manufacturing for myself and john uh i believe for john he does pretty much everything uh for myself uh darkstar gear he does most of the manufacturing that we have so what what will happen is he'll produce the shells and we'll do the final buffing folding finishing assembly uh, for Filster, I believe he does everything and sends it to their distributor. That's cool. So it's, and, you know, back to a lot of this, something that I don't think was explicitly mentioned, um, you know, so we got Henry Holsters, Filster, Darkstar Gear, uh, not present, but Tony Mayer, Jam Custom, uh, also make good products. Um and actually, you know, if you ever want him on, let me know. We can get him on. I yeah, I talk with him quite often. Yeah, I took um, a shotgun class with him two years ago, and okay, yeah, he, he ran a thirteen oh one as well. So, the Brotherhood. Oh yeah. So if you have the also if you have the QDC, uh, I don't know if you if you've seen the QDC pouches. Mm -mm. I just use them for pouches. You, you don't have that. I don't have that. Okay. Uh, these are. Yeah, these are actually. Uh, finally coming out of kind of poked around for years at trying to, to manufacture them. And for, for the equipment I have on hand in my, uh, you know, my current basement, you know, doing the day job thing also, um, I had to outsource part of it and I finally found somebody who can uh, compression farm it for me. So those will be available soon. Cool. Um, but yeah, so Andrew does uh, a, a good bit of that. And that's kind of, I don't want to say niche, but that's kind of where he's landed. Yeah. Um, so, Well, I think uh, along with the brands that you just mentioned, I think uh, Bowiedemann's up there for everyone, everyone that we've just listed. These are all, all our, I can't talk. These are artists. These guys are very good at what they do and the, their designs are, are genius. And I guess you're including that too, but it's it's really cool to see different takes on on the same type of uh, concept, and how execution varies slightly. Um, yeah, just really really cool to see the the differences. Where at the end products though are are incredibly they're they're nicely refined compared to all the all the crap that's available. So that's. Yeah, that, that part's interesting. Um, every once in a while, it comes up where some people are like, well, how can, you know, how can Andrew, John, and, you know, Darkstar Gear, uh, you know, coexist? And, you know, we're all set, we're, we're solving the same problem. We're all cognizant of the same problem. Um, you know, pulling up, uh, you know, the Philly EDC channel. So, you know, John, nine years ago, had his channel going and I know he was you know, working before he had his YouTube channel. So we're all over 10 years into this game. Um, Andrew has been around you know, a little bit longer than I have. I've been around, you know, 2008. So, you know, JM around the same time, you know, we're kind of all solving the same problems, but we've all got different takes on it. Um, and, you know, you look at a Henry holster, you look at a Filster and you look at my stuff and it's all, if you understand the principles of what we're trying to do, you know, there are, you know, I might be, and, and somebody listening to this might take this the wrong way. Um, I might be a 97% solution where John might be a 95% solution. Andrew might be, you know, a, a 97% solution, a slightly different way. Um, but it's all slightly different takes and, you know, working off the same principles and knowledge and whatnot. So, and, 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 and back to, you know, how we handle, you know, I know Andrew and myself, actually, I think uh, John mentioned also how we handle some of the customer service issues is, is all kind of the same. It's, you know, at some point in time, you know, 
you know, somebody who buys one of my holsters, one of Andrews and one of John's, they may not realize that, you know, for the brunt of the work, it may have been one of Andrews employees that actually made the holster, but they may land, you know, on A, B or C. Um, the other end of it is they might buy one of mine and think it absolutely sucks. You know, I might say, you know, yeah, we'll take the return, you know, shoot it here. Let me know. Um, you know, have you thought about a new belt? You know, what kind of pants were you wearing? Um, you know, what else did you do to it? And then they may go and apply those, you know, they may look at those questions I asked, never respond to me, but then apply what, what I've given them to a Filster or Henry Holsters or a JM. And that may be where they land. That might be the, uh, that might be their brand for the rest of their life. And that's, you know, it's fine. Well, the whole story I just got from you uh, a couple days ago. Uh, the finish work on it to me is it, it makes the holster almost seem softer. It's, it definitely makes it more comfortable and it's, it's so, noticeable. So, and the, and I noticed this, this is the first thing I noticed when I got my, my first JM not too long ago for my uh, 1911. It's, it's, it's stuff that the normal normal people are probably going to overlook and they're not going to see oh yeah look at this look at the smoothed edge and this this rounded curve here and so that's one of the things that i kind of you know i you know with the engineering background i i have kind of approached things from principle based so what do we like to do and you know uh, it's kind of hard to show up is everything that touches the body is smooth and rounded as much as it can be. Yeah. Um, you know, like here's a kind of a hard edge. It's not really a problem because where it's located, you know, this part is so far below the belt. It's generally not contacting uh, pelvic tissue, but the next iteration of this is going to be smoothed out. You know, your controls are smooth, rounded and flattened. Um, you know, the, the muzzle is now I, I run a closed muzzle. Um, one of the things that, so, you know, compare and contrast like the Filster Pro series compared to what I offer, you know, if we, let's, if we talk in a Glock space, um, you know, the concession, the only concession I've ever made in design wise is offering a G19. And that's honestly because there was um, some group, company, agency, or whatever that required a G19 and, you know, G19 only. So I delivered a G19 and G19 only to satisfy that. Um, otherwise, you know, 17 length or, you know, longer. Um, the the Walther, you know, we're releasing a PPQ holster, Um you know, pretty soon once we, you know, once the final round of testers are all, all happy, um, you know, that PBQ holster you have is, is like five inch long. Um, I'm not going to offer anything shorter. You know, there's, there's no, there's no you know, there's no agency. I'm sorry. Oh, there's no reason. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, there's, it, as far as adoption goes, um, there's no agency. The G19 is ubiquitous. You know, that's, you know, you're, you're fighting. I don't know when that came out. I, you know, we're 84, 85 for the 17, you know, when was the, when did the 19, you know, the 19, I don't know if it came out in the early nineties or whatever, but you know, that's a, you know, a brand that started in late 2008. I, I, I can't fight with, you know, the big, uh, the ubiquity of a G19. So I had to offer it. Otherwise, you know, it's 17 or longer and, you know, that, you know, the, the, the PBQ, you know, looking at the range they offer, you know, five inch or so was the way to go. Um, well, here's my Q4 lined up roughly with the trigger guard of the holster and you have a good inch or so, yeah. but that whole keel principle, it's going to make it much more comfortable, much more stable. I'm a fan. Right. And actually one of the things, you know, back to the whole, you know, 2020 opened our eyes, um, you know, so many, you know, 2020 was the, the, you know, the year where I paid for marketing. Um, you know, I think I put probably 
without doing the actual math, I, I think I probably paid probably 15% of our pro, of our profits on, or 15% of our yearly cost into marketing for 2020. And that brought me a lot of new customers and that was good, you know, in terms of having a lot of new customers, but also, you know, again, you know, with, you know, in, you know, if you have, if you operate within, I think we're around one and a quarter to one and a third percent uh, returns. Um, you know, if you got, you know, let's say 2%, if you got 2% returns on a hundred items, that's, you know, that's two holsters return. But if you go and have a year like 2020, you know, it's like, Holy shit, what am I doing wrong? But, you know, it's not that you're doing anything wrong. It's just that, you know, going from, you know, a couple of returns a month to, you know, maybe five or six returns a month, you know, while that's doubling, you know, we could actually be, you know, if I go and do the final tally on the numbers of 2020, we could actually fall under 1%, but just the, you know, the, the, the volume of returns is insane. Twenty twenty. But no, the, um, so, so the big thing there is, you know, it was a good year in, in growth and whatnot, but you know, the, the biggest thing we learned was, you know, marketing. I've got a, you know, I've been, I've been working on probably, I think it'll wind up being like eight or nine initial, you know, initial uh, slides to show, um, you know, things we've learned along the way. You know, they're basically illustrations of, you know, principles. Um, how do you make this thing work? You know, I've, I've gone through emails, and, you know, somebody mentioned in the chat um, and, and Dan mentioned it actually of having, you know, notepad files of, of generic responses saved. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody has, you know, this response, you know, it's like, well, the holster is longer because this, or, you know, if you have this problem, do this, if you have this problem, do that kind of thing. And trying to go and put those into a, a more, a more consumable format. And, and to me, um, you know, that's a, that's going to be like an illustration. So I've got, I've got somebody working on, if it works out well, it'll be kind of like a cyberpunk slash Archer illustration <laughs> that will have, um, you know, like, how do I, how do I make this conceal? Well, and it's like, well, move it left to right, you know, can it a little bit this way or that way, raise it up and down kind of thing. Um, you know, features of a holster, um, you know, belt wedge versus muzzle wedge, uh, you know, wing or claw, you know, or, you know, you know, trailing lever. Wait a minute. Um, wait a minute. What you're saying here is all these various holes right here, they can have staggered clips so you can change the cant. What? Yeah. Like, like, you know, it's, you know, sometimes you have to, you know, tweak things and, you know, crushed fingers they don't lose all the parts and assemble it incorrectly and uh have problems with it but yeah, yeah. cool so well that's 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 due out pretty soon yeah i i think it's past dan's bedtime he has an early oh. morning <laughs> oh yes oh yes i think it might be time to call it So before we do, other John is still at. Yes, other John is still active. Other, who who said they were, they were going to be joining us, but they didn't. Quietly watching, waiting yes. for the right moment to strike. Judging. So Dan, do you have anything to plug? Any final thoughts? Any things? Many things. Yeah. No. Um, glad to be on. Obviously, first time here. You know, always kind of surreal, right? Started watching uh, when I was. Six what it was tech oh. what was technically a deployment in 2018. Hmm. Um, yeah, I was like, what is this? Oh, this is a lot better than the shit I've been watching. Yeah. Uh, I'll never leave my room and watch Ever. all the things. Yeah. Uh, no, glad to be here. Uh, learned a lot. Cool to hang out with everybody. Uh, if you're interested in the things I have to say, or you think I'm an idiot and want to tell me so and give me views for it, uh, check us out on Facebook at Primer Peak. And our website is primerpeak, 
Primer.com. Primer, like the thing in the back of the gun, uh, like, excuse me, in the back of a uh, round of ammunition. Peak like the top of the mountain, right? Uh, yeah, PrimerPeak.com. Come tell me I'm fat because sidecars don't work for me. Hey, clicks are still clicks. Oh, it's... fuck yeah. Hate clicks. And and I think we can, I can pretty much guarantee you guys, as soon as I put this on YouTube, it will get somewhere between four and six thumbs down right off the bat. Perfect. Yeah. Because someone cares. It shows there there's someone, at least one person out there. And if it's one person, they have multiple accounts. They care that much that they're going to waste <laughs> their time. Or it's a couple people. It's a group. And they, they care so much, they need to do that despite the content. Tom, how about they're you? still watching. They, well, I don't know about that. Uh, darkstargear.com, uh, facebook.com slash darkstargear, uh, at darker, uh, darkstargear on Instagram. Yeah, pretty much it. We've been around forever. Uh, you know, we're probably third wave appendix carry now. I don't know. Um, as far as stuff goes, but, you know, been doing it before it was cool and now it's cool and it's not cool. You know, I've been trying to, <laughs> no, I've been trying to, you know, play the marketing game and kind of actually try it this for a little bit now. So good stuff. Well, let's see here. Uh, big thanks to Filster. Big thanks to Staccato. Big thanks to Walter Firearms. Also, big thanks to our Patreon subscribers. Uh, it's because the Patreon subscribers that we're able to do this stuff. Uh, it's, I'm able to commit literally hours, not only to do the show itself, but also there's hours in uh, producing it and editing it and all that other stuff, the hosting, the, the software. Patreon is not just covering the podcast. It's also covering forum costs and all kinds of other stuff. And if you don't want to go through Patreon, if you don't want to use PayPal on the forum, primary and secondary.com slash forum, there is a way to um, help support this stuff too under forum support. There are different tiers, there are benefits to it. If uh, you haven't messed with forums, please join us. It's a lot of fun. Uh, on a forum, the, the posts and replies are crafted. On Facebook, posts and replies are vomited. There's a big difference. Um, but we have a, a, a great community on, on the forum. Uh, great people, great companies are there. Also great communities. As I say normally, support those sources that you have found to be beneficial. If you like what our panelists said, find them, track them down on social media, YouTube, and all those other places. Make sure you're giving them clicks. Make sure you're giving them likes and subscribe. Same for us. I definitely appreciate um, any shares, likes, subscriptions that we receive. Because as I say, typically, unfortunately, we live in an era where that is currency and that is that provides influence. And kind of like what someone said earlier in the ed episode tonight, just because someone has a huge following doesn't mean they have a clue. But a following kind of helps with a little bit of, it helps push a little bit. Uh, training Summit's coming up in September. We have an awesome uh, panel of instructors coming to teach. Um, I think that's all I got. Yeah, I think I'm going to stop talking now. Yeah. I'll talk to you guys later. <laughs>